Good morning, everyone. The Media Institute of the Caribbean is very pleased to present this, our fourth and final session in our climate justice series, Climate Justice Journalistic Perspectives, which is supported by Open Society Foundations. Today is Thursday, the 7th of April, 2022. And today we decided to make the final day very interactive with three panel discussions. I am Kiran Maharaj, president of MIC, and I just wanted to ensure that I remind everyone of the house rules. The moderators will stay the question and answer segments, and everyone here is invited to ask our panelists anything. A reminder that we are recording today's sessions, which will be placed in the public domain via our YouTube channel. You can ask your questions by raising your hand or putting your questions in the chat box. Our moderators will decide with our panelists at what point those questions will be taken. We also have a call out for story submissions at this current point in time, and it runs until April 20th. Our journalists throughout the region are encouraged to submit their story ideas to micstoryideas at gmail.com. We will have an editorial review, and we will get back to everyone who submits a story idea for us to decide which stories we will be able to help fund um, in this first round of our Climate Justice uh, Fellowship Series. So with that, um, I want to welcome everyone again, especially our presenters, and they are in different time zones all over the place. So I just want to say how much we appreciate you taking the time and adjusting your schedules to be here with us. We're going to start our first panel on the art of telling the human interest story, but from climate angles. And so we went to our colleagues and friends at the Pulitzer Foundation, and they have um, told us which three people stood out to them to uh, interact with our journalists on this project. So I'm very happy that Tony, Carly, and Ayurella could be with us this morning. So welcome. I'm sorry we can't welcome you in person, but don't worry, uh, COVID won't happen forever. We will get to a point where we can all meet in one place. So good morning again and welcome and thank you for your willingness to be part of this effort with us. It's always nice for us to have a fellow journalist doing things that are similar to what we are doing in other parts of the world, because sometimes when we, we come together and our heads come together, it gives us better insight. We get to exchange these ideas and experiences, but your work has stood out definitely for the Pulitzer Center, your work has stood out. And um, I wanted you to share your insights. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. And then I'm going to start asking you a little bit more about best practices in your industry. So we're going to let the gentleman go first. We rarely ever get the opportunity to let the gentleman go first. So ladies, we're going to stand aside to let Tony tell us a little bit about himself and his work. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, name, my name is Tony, and I'm uh, a reporter for the Charleston Post and Courier in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been a reporter for about 30 years. I'm just so honored to be with you all. Um, uh, Charleston is on the, the southeastern coast. It's, you know, very low-lying territory. And as you can see behind me, this is what my street looks like after a kind of a regular downpour. It's, you know, it has gone up to my stick shift in my car. It's, it gets very deep. So climate change is very real to me. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's when I'm working on my sort of climate change stories, I really feel like those are the stories that are, you know, have the greatest impact. And I really feel a, a tremendous amount of passion in, in, in doing these stories. I really believe that our climate change stories will help save the world if we can do them right. So I've done a couple of stories for the Pulitzer, with the Pulitzer Center's help. Um, one was uh, called Rising Waters which was a, a very unique model for, for doing climate change stories. Um, we basically pre-reported a bunch of information about uh, climate change issues that directly affect us. And then when we had an inevitable storm, like you might see behind us, we embedded that deeply reported research into a breaking news story and giving readers you know, a, a chance to really experience uh, context and depth when their minds were focused on it. 
We also did another story last year where we went to Greenland of all places, and we connected what's happening in Greenland with what's happening directly to our coastline here in South Carolina. So I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. I'm just honored again to, to, uh, to be with you here this morning. Thank you, Tony. Kali? Thank you again for, for having me. Uh, really a pleasure to be here with you. And um, my family is all from Charleston, South Carolina. So I always you know, love reading and learning more about it. Um, but I am based in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and I, these days, am reporting for the public radio station here, but I'm mostly going to be talking about reporting I did um, for a nonprofit outlet called Southerly, which covers the environment and climate change across the American South. And I did a project for Southerly with support from the Pulitzer Center in late 2020 and early 2021 about hurricane recovery in the southwestern part of Louisiana which was hit by two back-to-back -back hurricanes in the extremely active hurricane season of 2020. Um, and I, I did um, basically a series of stories, you know, when um, this is a part of the state that doesn't have a really robust local newspaper and um, national outlets who, you know, kind of came down to cover the sort of day one look at, at hurricane recovery had had really left within, you know, a couple of weeks. And so we decided to, you know, seek support from the Pulitzer Center to be able to do a really, you know, to, to stay on that story when other reporters had left it. And what I was really focused on there was looking at um, how communities were recovering the pandemic. Hurricane recovery looked really different when, you know, people couldn't be in shelters altogether or couldn't evacuate altogether. There was, you know, all of these different factors um, that made recovery look really different and even more challenging um, during the context of the pandemic. So I focused first on what voting looked like. This was ahead of the presidential election in 2020 when, you know, so many people in this region were still displaced. Um, I did a story on teachers and the impact of, you know, uh, you know, the mental health of their students um, who were, you know, out of school for the pandemic and then two hurricanes. And then lastly, I, um, I did sort of a big culminating story about the lack of affordable housing in this region after these two storms that had decimated the housing stock um, and sort of the challenges um, with folks trying to get aid from FEMA. Um, and you know, continuing to be displaced for months after these storms. Um, so I can I can go into more depth later, but that's a little bit about um, where I'm coming from. Thank you, Kali. Ayurello, your team. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayurella. I'm a uh, freelance journalist. I'm based out of Tampa, Florida, and a correspondent at Climate Central, which is a news and research nonprofit where I've spent the last almost three and a half years now covering uh, climate news across the US. In the past, I was an associate producer at WPLG, which is an ABC News affiliate here in Miami, um, as well as a freelance reporter for the New Times, Broward Palm Beach and the Miami New Times. So the majority of my climate reporting to date has been done through Climate Central, and Climate Central has a journalism model, which is partnership based. So what that means is that nearly all of the work that I produce for Climate Central is um, within collaborations with local reporters based across the country. And uh, I produce print, digital, radio and TV news. A lot of this is multimedia coverage and it focuses on climate changes impacts on these areas and these communities um, and those of course, those impacts vary. So um, some examples of the reporting that I've done is covering everything from the health impacts of tailpipe admissions and how those are exacerbated by warming temperatures. I've done coverage on, on that in uh, Florida and Iowa. I've also done coverage uh, extensively on affordable housing units and how those are vulnerable to sea level rise and flood prone. And I focused on Miami, Boston, and New Jersey for that. I've reported on the Black, Latinx, and Indigenous cultural history impacted by coastal flooding. And that was a series uh, focused on St. Augustine, Florida, New Jersey, and also in Miami. I've done coverage on hurricane disaster recovery in Bay County, Florida. 
And more recently, I did a, a series actually covering how faith leaders in Kansas, in New York, and Key West are responding to climate change in a local perspective. So those are some examples of the work I've done to date. I am also um, under contract at the Louisiana State University Press, uh, where I've spent the last year when I'm not reporting for Climate Central, working on my largest journalistic project yet, which is writing my first nonfiction book, and that's about climate change and invasive plants in the U.S. Okay, that, very exciting there. So I think we have some really um, varied experiences. And so I'm gonna ask Pazla to put some of your story links in the chat box so our, our participants can look at them while we're, we're talking. But one of the first things I wanted to ask you, um, because we're talking about looking at the, the climate change stories from the human side, that's really what this is about anyway, right? Um, the impacts on us. But what do you think we need to remember as journalists when we have to look at the human side of the stories? Like what do you, go into a story with at the top of your mind, what are the key things that you keep asking yourselves in order to ensure that you get the right perspective and story out to the wider public? So Tony, let's start with you. So to answer your question, Kieran, uh, I would invite all of you to imagine that you're walking down a path in one of your beautiful islands. You know, life is good, it's a beautiful day, when suddenly in front of you, you see a very large and very dangerous poisonous snake about to strike you. And in that moment, uh, I'd ask you, what will you not do? What will you not do? So I imagine that you probably wouldn't debate whether that snake is real. You probably wouldn't um, deny that it's, uh, you know, denies existence. You probably will not procrastinate. I think I can guarantee that your brain's neural networks will light up and the amygdala, which is your brain's freak out center, will go ape and in a flash, your brain will tell you to get the hell out of the way of that snake. Our brains are literally wired to respond to immediate and visible threats. And that's a problem when it comes to climate change stories because the drivers of climate change are essentially invisible. They're invisible snakes, if you will. And that, that's a problem because we don't respond with such uh, the kind of urgency that we need to. So what I try to do when I'm taking into account uh, my, my, my climate change stories is remember to focus on the now, focus on what's happening now to, to people. Uh, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm reading about climate change stories and I see that there's something happening in 30 years or, oh, it's gonna, sea rise is gonna be up, uh, you know, up a foot in 30 years, I tend to tune out and I'm really into this stuff. So, but we can, when we focus on what's happening to people now and what, um, what has, has happened, I think then we grab our readers in a much more real way and, um, and, and we can hold them there. So I would encourage everybody to start thinking about what's happening to, to us now because we're really seeing the impacts um, and, and just keep that top of mind. Thanks for that, Tony. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. And I will remember those snakes. Um, Kali. Yeah, I really like that metaphor. Um, but similarly, I, I think I, I try to meet people where they're at with these stories. Um, so I, I've spent a lot of time reporting in a part of Louisiana where people don't necessarily use the language of climate change, right? But they're recognizing that there's more extreme weather. They're recognizing that there's more flooding. And I, I try to use that as sort of the entry point for my reporting. Um, you know, my reporting has largely focused on disaster recovery and, and also preparedness. And I think, you know, anyone can see that that is a really pressing issue and it impacts people's lives in a really direct way. Um, but then I sort of try to draw out a larger climate angle from there. Um, and I think that that starting point allows me to really kind of be starting on the human level, trying to use language that actually gets through to people and then sort of bringing them along um, to show the sort of larger, um, larger context of climate change. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave that there. Thanks for that. Yeah, I think that that you touch on an important point. They don't understand all of the climate change jargon. And that's something that we've we've said a few times, you know, during our webinar series that we need to really break it down for the public. So thanks for that, Carly. 
Ayurello. Yeah, no, those are, are fantastic points. I also really appreciate Tony's metaphor. I think um, building on those points, I'd probably say that it's very clear that climate change impacts everything. We know that um, the people, the communities that are the hardest hit are frontline communities. And I always like to say that you can't tell the climate change story without telling the environmental justice story. You know, climate change deepens inequalities, it deepens social divides. We know that um, across the US that those that suffer the most from these impacts belong to Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous communities, and that people in poverty have a higher chance of experiencing the ill effects of climate change because of increased exposure, increased vulnerability. So my, I guess my recommendation um, for these stories is, is always just making sure there's representation of frontline communities in the reporting that we're, that we're doing on climate change's impacts. Thanks for that. Um, I just wanna remind all of our participants and you, you can raise your hand using the raise hand feature or you can put your questions in the chat so we can take them, you know, cause you are part of this discussion. Um, I wanna go back a little bit to, to looking for the stories. So Tony, you talked about these snakes, right? And the climate justice has a lot of issues, as Ayurala just pointed out. There are much deeper issues that come with the climate change stories. Those are the climate justice issues. But where do you look for the stories? What leads you into getting those story ideas that become impactful? Yeah, that's a great question, because I would say that most of my stories, whether it's corruption or climate change, usually begin with a conversation with somebody. Um, and and then the, the challenge is identifying within that conversation a, a larger and, and deeper story that you can, you can go after. And an example was a, a few years ago, I was talking to a scientist who had been studying zooplankton for 40 years. He developed this wonderful time series, this big database showing that the zooplankton had taken a swan dive off our coast. That's a huge issue. And, and he's, he's, he just says in a very matter of fact voice, Tony, you know, I've We've seen a 40% drop in zooplankton here, and it's happening across um, the, uh, along the East Coast. And he said it in such a matter of fact way that I might have missed it. But uh, I said, Dennis, that's a 40% drop in one of the first links in the food chain, right? And he said, yeah, and climate change is, is part of the equation. So from that, you know, that little bit of conversation, you know, I ended up doing a big project about um, about what's happening with ocean plankton, especially phytoplankton, which not many people realize produces 50% of the oxygen we breathe. But it was one of those, you know, and sad to say, there's a lot of things happening to the phytoplankton, our most important oxygen producers. And, but these are the stories that you can kind of miss if you don't really, um, you know, listen hard to, uh, to, usually some scientists. So I encourage people to get to know scientists in their, on their respective islands, because inevitably there's gonna be some research going on there. Um, also look, um, try to sort of scan what kinds of studies are being done in the United States that might be connected to what's uh, happening in your, your locations. And, uh, and I, it, inevitably there are some scientists near you who know what's going on and, and often make really great stories themselves because most scientists are just sort of detectives if you can understand their language. I'm sure that Steve and Dr. Trotz are probably uh, weaving the pom-poms right now, <laughs> but yes. And I think that it also tells us, so you know, you said you, you get these ideas from people. It stresses the importance of staying connected you know, around subject areas. So thank you for that. Kali, what about you? Yeah, I would say most of my stories sort of originate on the community level. And so when um, I started reporting out in Lake Charles, I had, uh, I got connected very early on to a woman named Tasha Gidry, who is extremely well connected in that community. She leads a, a Black business owners group. And very early on, she just gave me an extensive driving tour of the city started introducing me to people. And so similarly, you know, that connectedness is what ultimately led to, to all of the stories that I did out there. Um, and I, you know, I think I mentioned up top, um, I did this three-part series that culminated in a story about issues facing renters and lack of affordable housing. That story came about because 
the folks I was interviewing for those earlier stories kept saying, you know, there's nowhere to rent right now. People can't come back. Everyone is, you know, all these people are displaced because there's nowhere for them to come back to. And I kept pulling on that thread and getting connected to more people in that community. And um, also I spent a lot of time on these big recovery Facebook groups that often crop up after disasters. And I, you know, would put out Google Forms questionnaire saying, you know, I'm looking to speak to, you know, renters who are facing X, Y, and Z things. If you're interested in talking to a reporter, fill out this form and I'll get in touch with you. And so I started sort of introducing a feedback loop there um, where I was um, seeking people to talk to about a certain thing, seeing what they came back to me and then, you know, uh, crafting the stories from there. And I would say, even beyond that, um, something that I'm always thinking about when I'm looking for stories is what information do people need about an issue? Um, so what we would often do with these southerly pieces is create a, a guide that would be sort of embedded in these stories with information about, you know, maybe where to get resources about a certain thing or learn more about a certain thing. And that was sort of a guiding principle as well, you know, not just what is the sort of interesting or illuminating angle on something, but what do people in this community need to know? Um, how can we really distill that information in a way that um, is best suited to them? So. Thanks for that, Connie. Are you all in? Yeah, I, I mean, that's those are re really good pieces of advice from Carly and Tony. Um, I think the only thing I would add that hasn't already been said is at least personally, and I'm sure everyone on this call um, in the gym journalism world really has similar experiences. I I always follow follow the conversation, kind of like what Tony said, but I follow leads that are given to me while I'm reporting other stories, and then that actually ends up. Um, I'll be interviewing someone, for example, a, a couple of years ago. I did this uh, coverage for Southerly, actually. Um, and I was doing it for Southerly and Climate Central. I was reporting a story for Climate Central on wildfires in Northern Florida. And I was interviewing um, emergency response teams there uh, about disaster recovery and how they were reacting to this wildfire in this, this one small town in the Panhandle. And um, that led to a conversation with someone working in Bay County that was complaining about how, you know, in 2018, uh, the Panhandle was hit by this Category 5 hurricane that just devastated the area. And, you know, almost two years later, they are dealing with this extremely slow rebuilding process. COVID had hit uh, and there was a looming hurricane season. And these, like, this team was just overwhelmed. Um, and that actually led me to go back to Climate Central. And we ended up building this collaboration with Southerly and pitched this story about covering this disaster recovery process down the line and, and all the issues with the lack of funding and, and support there for the communities. Um, so I think the moral of that story is, is always just keep your, your eyes and ears open for what your current reporting, what rabbit holes it might lead you down because you might end up with an even stronger piece that you didn't expect when you started out. Thanks for that, Colleen. I really like your idea too of the Google Docs, you know, and, and following the, the Facebook book groups, because I think we have a lot of that in this region. I know we have journalists here who have covered um, a lot of a lot of stories. Um, and I was wondering if anybody here wants to chime in with, you know, what um, what you all do, where you all get your story ideas from um, and share, you know, your experiences and insights with the others. Anybody want to go first? Yes, I think I can share. Which money don't Yes, I'm Fishmani Thomas. Um, recently, the interior of Suriname has, is a bit different. Suriname is above Brazil. So uh, the interior has a lot of um, hills, rocks, and um, toward the coastal area that's more populated. But recently we got a, a heavy floods there because the river were overflowing. And um, the problem there ha was that uh, we have still villages, people living in villages a bit in their uh, old styles, and um, they had to be evacuated. 
but some of them don't even want to go away from that area because they're accustomed to fishing, hunting there for their food. And so government um, agencies had to bring food and supplies for them there because they cannot live off crops. Um, we have things like um, cassava and um, the fish, they couldn't even catch any fish or go hunting. And even clean drinking water, even though they were surrounded by so, so much water and uh, they couldn't even use that. And to be honest, they even drink water from the river. That's the situation in Suriname for these people but because of the flood the water got pop um it wasn't clean enough so that was momentary the situation actually now they're in a recovery stage but because um sometimes it's raining a lot and then it less then you have this situation the biggest challenge right now is also for reporters to go to the interior because you have to take these it's either you have a helicopter and we don't have resources for that, or you have to like drive very far. And then um, from a certain area, you have to go in these really small boats and you have to go in sulas. We call it sulas, it's like really stumbly rocks and go through them to go to these areas. So it's also very dangerous for you as journalists to go to those places to do reporting. So we're sometimes in contact with the government agencies. Um, we have NCCR, these are like CDEMA um, in our country that do the outreach for them and they're um, specialized in um, these cases. And sometimes um, for me right now, because I'm Dutch speaking, I have to translate sometimes my Dutch into English. <laughs> And um, that is our, right now the situation. Now we have uh, the moment where our schools are flooded, they have muds, they're trying to clean up that. Um, and in listening to you guys, indeed it's triggering me like, we like to uh, report on the current situation, but we do not do the aftermath, like the stories afterwards, like how other kids going to school, because right now Easter vacation had to, uh, start like after a week but because of the current situation the kids cannot go to school there the the easter holiday was um was earlier than planned only so the government and um uh, uh let's say on the how do you say on the again uh the school system could could actually be able to uh yeah, incorporate that in that whole system because now they have a learning a problem because a lot is not being um, given to the kids. And now even that's a big, bigger issue right now because those kids are going to be held back in comparison to the kids in other uh, districts. So right now it's a, a difficult situation. So Vishwahani, let me just ask you, and I see Zadie and Elisha have their hands up as well, but um, in terms of when you're reporting and having to go to these areas, do you get any kind of assistance or support from the disaster management authorities? Yes, you get, um, actually, we are dependent, uh, we get the information from them. There is a coordinator, and the moment they go into the area and when they come back, uh, you get the information from them. They provide you pictures also, and um, you can always call them, send them an app. We do a lot through WhatsApp when it comes to information. They send voice messages. You just send your, because they cannot respond immediately, so you send your uh, questions, and they in a voice message, they will always answer you and even ask for videos or uh, uh, pictures, they will send it for you. But we also work with the people living there. You have in every, um, let's say, a village, you have a ca captain um, in that village ahead. And he don't, they are mostly provided with the phones from Digicel and so. And you can always contact them, like, what is the situation momentarily? And that's how you get your information. So technology actually helps in being able to do good reporting. Thanks for that, Vishwani. We have a better understanding of your challenges in Suriname. Thanks so much for explaining that in detail. Zadi? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Well, Hi. yeah, technology, as she said. I, I call a lot of people just to chat. 
Um, ordinary people that I know just to chat and ask, you know, what's going on. I also read a lot of government papers. People tend to overlook them, but sometimes a line can point you to something. I read a lot of journals and, and so on. And I also subscribe, as you said earlier, to um, the Facebook groups. Um, I follow, you know, influential people in, in the area that I want to hear about on, on social media and so on. But um, a lot of it, it's, it's about hard work and we have to read a lot. And sometimes we forget that we have to read, we have to continuously read and, and study some of the things. And then I also like to talk to Dr. Trotz, just you know, casually. He's my good friend, he used to be my, my supervisor. So I, I chat a lot um, with people like those um, to get an idea about what is happening. Thanks, thanks for that. Alicia? Right, hi, for me it's a, a bit different. We have a lot of groups, in, informal groups here, and we have some formal ones like the Environmental Awareness Group. They often post stuff when they, they see something is wrong. Uh, we have a marine biologist who does the same, and we also have just various groups like Wild Caribbean who post things ever so often to Facebook. And there's where a lot of interaction um, takes place. For example, I think it was this week that the marine biologist posted about the dying off of sea urchin and the fact that it was noticed in certain parts of Antigua, and he was asking persons to report if they'd seen any. And so majority of the things are there. The problem though is, again, we report in small newsrooms. I like to say we have two main news agencies on Antigua. One is the national station owned by the government and of course Observer who you know, balances that act <laughs> on, on political opposition. Um, but the problem is we report surface news, at least that's what I like to call it. In terms of something like that happened, we'd report and say, okay, the sea urchins are dying off, but nobody goes in depth and say, okay, why are they dying off? Why are they important? How, where did this start? And I think it's mostly because one, there's a lack of interest when it comes to environmental news. And because we have so many things doing at the same time, as you say, we have to pick the one that's more important or that can get us more advertising or persons want to read, which is why I said to myself, okay, this is, there is this gap that I need to fill, which is why I started the website because I wanted to be able to focus more on climate issues, disaster issues. For example, I'm pretty sure that you haven't seen a lot of news coming on the aftermath of Barbuda after Hurricane Irma. Uh, from us in particular, you have persons coming internationally and regionally and reporting on it. And there's nothing from Antigua because Antigua's media doesn't really have a presence on Barbuda. So if it's not someone calling into the radio station, there is no journalist on Barbuda to say, okay, this is what I, I'm investigating. This is what is happening. And so you have, you know, those kinds of issues. And of course, we have our own environmental issues on Antigua, which are pretty much large scale. You have the development of two special economic zones that are threatening uh, the marine environment and environment on land. And I think it, it would take a team of people who are dedicated to that sort of news to kind of bring it forward, to push the agenda and to allow people to say, okay, this is something that we really do should care about because one of our biggest issues is that people don't care because people don't know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that, Alicia. I think you raise an important point and a challenge we have in the region, which is resources. You know, human resources, technical resources. It's a challenging for us. Freeman. Um, thanks, Kieran. Yeah, I was just going to say here in the BBI after, after Irma, one thing we found, you'd look at news coverage of, of bigger disasters elsewhere. Um, obviously, we have a very small newsroom and there's you know, only so much we can cover, but we could look at Katrina, for example, we looked at the Katrina co uh, coverage a lot after Hurricane Irma, and you could almost, uh, it's obviously this has got, Katrina's got, you know, tons and tons of reporting on it, and we could look at all those stories and find sort of, it was almost like we could predict the future of how the recovery is going to go, what the problems are going to be, and that kind of thing, and get got a lot of story ideas that way. Um, even as a small newsroom, you just kind of figure out how to whittle it down, and uh, report those those same kind of stories. 
And I think that works with other stories as well. Like Tony was talking about this plankton. Um, you see those other stories and that's happening here too, even though we, we're small communities a lot of the time and don't necessarily have the scientists uh, on, on the ground here that study that, but they might be studying it from abroad. So just a couple ideas from here. Thanks. Thanks, Matt Freeman. <clears throat> so one of the, you know, one of the issues that comes up, and we talk about the, the resources and lack of, and everybody, you know, I think has their, their own approach to how we look at the stories. But I think that we also recognize that everybody has their own best practices they work by, you know, to get the job done. And so because this session was done really to be an exchange of ideas, I wanted to ask you all, because you're highly regarded um, with what you do in, in your societies, you know, what are some of those best practices? So as usual, we'll, we'll start with Tony. Well, thank you. Yeah. So one, I'll offer a couple of tips. Um, one thing I do when I'm, when I'm trying to uh, sort out uh, a complex story, um, such as what's happening with the ocean plankton, um, I ask myself, what's the, in one word, one or two words, what is this story about? And then I ask myself, okay, what's the story really about? And I keep asking myself that question until I get to a theme that is inevitably, you know, undeniably universal. It's raw and real, it's something that everybody can connect with, like, you know, denial, betrayal, greed, uh, uh, beauty, mystery. And for instance, in the plankton story, um, I, I asked myself, what's the story about uh, plankton? Um, what's it really about? Mm, climate change. Uh, what's it really about? Beauty. Because I was really, I thought the plankton was really pretty. And then eventually I got down to a mystery. And so people will not read 5,000 words about plankton. I, I, uh, who would want to do that? And I don't think a lot of people are going to read 5,000 words about climate change. But people will read books about a mystery. And so I shape stories with around those themes. And that really helps me um, connect to, to readers in a, in a way that they all can, can rally around. And then I think there's another thing that I, I'd like just to mention, just how I structure my stories. I'm going to try to share my screen just real briefly, um, if I can. And it's, yeah. it's how we I... Can... It's how I structure a, a larger piece, and you know, typically it's you know it's very similar to what you might do with a, a novel or a, a larger nonfiction piece. You know, I break stories that are a little, uh, especially stories that are over fifteen hundred words, into chapters, if you will, and and I really like to create a, a structure to these chapters where it begins with an anecdote and then it somehow it ends with a cliffhanger at the end. See that sort of pointing upside down triangle. And that propels the reader, obviously, into the next chapter when you do the same thing. And then you keep doing that, you, you, you allow to sort of give the reader a, a, an ability to, to really move through your story in a, in a more, you know, in a more rapid way. So if you ever uh, want to sort of understand the importance of cliffhangers, I invite you to read a book by uh, Deborah Bloom, who works at MIT, and she did this great book called The Poisoner's Handbook. And she does, she, she goes through a very complicated issue um, in history, but, and she's just a master of putting cliffhangers in chapters, but also within the chapters. So your reader's just, just motoring through a very complex piece of writing. The, the next thing um, I'd, I'd like to mention is, you know, really try to identify characters. You know, characters are your, your salvation. They're the people who will guide you through a complex piece of writing. So this guy is an Elvis impersonator um, who, I, um, who also happens to be a scientist with NASA in the United States. And he's known as the climate Elvis. He mixes climate science with, um, with um, you know, his Elvis character. And he, he um, was a scientist who I met in Greenland and helped navigate, helped me understand what was happening in a very human way, an interesting way. Um, because the problem with a lot of these science stories is that the scientists themselves speak their own language and they're so hard to understand. But when you can find a character um, who can communicate clearly and, and in, in a language you can understand, and then you can sort of 
talk about his journey, uh, your writing is going to be so much easier. So I'll just stop there. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, I like the idea. I mean, I do. I don't know what the others feel, but I like the idea of the cliffhanger. Uh, I think it's good for a series as well because it will do what you're saying, which is to keep the audience attention. Anybody wants to, to give their opinion of, of Tony's approach? Anybody else try that approach as journalists? Nobody's, nobody's. Yeah, I was saying uh, once or twice in our newspaper stories, I have a tendency to write very detailed and long stories. And sometimes I have to, break them up and again it depends on the kind of stories that you're writing to get people to read the second and third part because for the most part uh politics sells here and a bit of human interest <laughs> stories and melee so outside of that it, it's a bit difficult but i have tried that before good okay thanks for that alicia tony thanks for that i i like that um, approach i think it's is a nice idea for us to, to play with and to try for some of us. Carly, what about you? You have best practice secrets. You told us about the, the Google Sheet, which I thought was really um, a nice way to get some expertise, you know, to weigh in. Um, it, and also probably less time consuming than, than calling people constantly. But what are your other best practices? Yeah, so I would say the main thing that I'm thinking about for basically any story that I'm doing is sort of the two levels of, you know, human story and larger context. So I'm always, you know, looking for someone, and Tony mentioned this too, but a character who can, you know, take us from beginning, middle, and end, and then through that illuminate a larger issue. And so with each of the stories that you know, I did for the Lake Charles project I've been talking about, um, I really kind of thought of them as profiles actually of individual people who could then, you know, show a reader, you know, what it was like to be a teacher who was displaced from their home while also continuing to teach students who were displaced from their homes. You know, what it was like to be someone who was evicted after a hurricane and then needed to travel across the state looking for shelter for weeks on end living in her car. Um, and that is the thing. I think you can do that with, you know, a short 500 word daily news story. And you can do that with, you know, long feature 2000 word stories. Um, that is the chief thing that I I'm thinking about to guide how I structure a story. Um, and I would say also just for some interviewing best practices, you know, I'm often talking to people who have gone through something extremely traumatic. And I, you know, I do a lot of housekeeping before I start an interview. I tell whoever I'm talking to, you know, the details of what I'm working on, kind of how they fit into it. Um, I make sure that I have their consent before I start recording. I tell them that, you know, especially if they haven't done an interview with a reporter before, I kind of explain what that means. And if they would like for anything to be on background or off the record, I explain that. Um, and the other thing that I do is I often call people back and fact check their interviews with me before we go to publication. I think especially for folks who are recounting, you know, what it was like to evacuate and then be displaced from their home for weeks on end. It's really hard to actually tell that story and get the chronology right when you're you're really worked up. And that was, of course, a really emotional and difficult thing to go through. And so I often find that I need to kind of go through that chronology and the, those, you know, the exact information with those people a few times in order to make sure that I'm getting it correctly. Um, so those are, those are a few of the things that I, um, that I do for interviewing and just, you know, making sure in that fact checking process that people feel good about what they're sharing and they they still feel okay about this going out into the world because that's that's the most important thing to me thanks Carly. um ayurala what about you and just so you, the rest of you know i'm coming to to you all as well because as i said this is a learning and sharing experience but let's hear from ayurala please sure um so carly shared a lot of the the tips i wanted to to share as well i think um 
my biggest interview reporting best practice tip is is to I always ask everybody that I speak to who else I should interview. Um, and I think that's really important because it does help you develop the story further than maybe you thought going in. I I like to say to keep reporting. That also helps you do that because you might think that you have gotten all the expert or research knowledge for a piece and then it, it turns out you don't. And, and you just discover that by asking that question. Um, I like to ask really dumb questions. And I know that sounds very interesting when it's phrased like that, but there's actually a really good, I think it came out uh, either late last year, early this year, the New York, a New York Times climate reporter, she published a piece about how she built her career in reporting, uh, asking, finding and asking really dumb questions. And, and I do the majority of my reporting is I, I speak with scientists and, and researchers that a, a lot of times have been in the this field and, and talking to reporters for for many, many years. Um, and I think you want to go in and you're, you're obviously really prepared and you've read their papers and you want to ask really intelligent questions. But if you don't ask the really basic ones um, and and if you're not, a, I think it's important to not be afraid to, to say if you don't understand a concept, uh, because some of them can be very complex. And if you don't do that while you're doing the interview, you could miss out on, on some of the most important pieces about the study or about their work. Uh, I always always ask, is, is there any question I didn't ask you that you wish I had or any topic we didn't discuss in this call that you think is important for me to know? I do that without fail at the end of every interview. And that is where that medium and that question is where I've, I've gotten some of the best quotes of my career. Um, and I think those are the, the main things and Carly touched on it. I, I think it's just best practice um, to always record your interviews, ask for permission to record, let them know that they're on the record. Uh, and yeah, I think that that kind of sums it up. Yeah, no, I think you make a good point about asking the very, very basic questions because at the end of the day, we have to inform the public. So I think, you know, it's important to, to, for us to constantly recognize and remember that you know they don't talk the technical they're not technical you know um, and we've said that in this series and others you know we need to to really break it down but to remember that we need to say it in a way that everybody understands it and is is very clear about it so i think that's very important for us to remember and you talked about recording and i think everybody here records their interviews but i wanted to remind everybody to back it up Right, uh, we're working on a project right now, and I know I have journalists there who are not backing up um, everything we're doing. So I just wanted to say, everybody, please remember to back up. Find a way to back up. External hard drive is very, very important to have, and um, to back up your work. But I wanted to hear from some of our journalists because we have journalists in this room who are different levels in their career, um, and so some of you may also have your best practices you want to share with some of the, the younger journalists who are here. So anybody you would like to share theirs? Maybe I should, I should ask Wesley to step in because he's the most senior journalist here. Wesley? Yeah, yeah well, well, Kiran, you know, uh, as I've said um, time and again over the past um, week, I think that climate change and the climate change as expressed as a crisis is reported on every single day. Uh, perhaps the same scientific language that um, the experts prefer uh, isn't used, um, but I think that in the language of simple everyday people, the climate story is being told. Um, Tony made the point about the immediacy of, of the news and information and the fact that you know, people are not necessarily looking um, 30 years from now, um, though the central message of our scientists, and, uh, and Tony probably knows that the, the leading scientists on climate change in the world come from this part of the world, um, the, the Caribbean. The 1.5 to stay alive um, slogan um, emerged from the Caribbean. And we have one of the framers of that on, the, on this call in the form of Dr. Trotz. So I, I would say that, yes, there is need for more nuance and perspective and background and context. Um, but, it, but I would say that the, the climate story is being told on a daily basis. 
whether it's through the flooding that occurs annually in uh, on the, the banks of the Karani River in Trinidad or, or the drought-like conditions, the, the worsening drought-like conditions in Antigua and Barbuda or the, the, the situation with the, with the annual hurricane season that comes and causes complete devastation in, in, in a lot of this. It's just that the framing, and I think that's one of the objectives of, of these two weeks of, of examination, self-examination as journalists, which is that the framing um, is needed. And sometimes the framing needs to look back a little bit and even to look forward. Because uh, if we talk about a climate crisis, we're not talking about, well, we're in the midst of the crisis, but what's the likely outcome of this crisis? Um, I think that we have to keep our eyes on that constantly. Otherwise, uh, an important part of the context is going to be missing. Thanks for that, Wesley. Dr. Trotz, your hand is up. I'm so happy that you're getting involved in this discussion because I know you really want journalists and media to, um, to weigh in more heavily than we do. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is just a gut reaction to the background of uh, Tony's screen when it appeared this morning. Uh, my first reaction, hell, this could be anywhere in the Caribbean. Could be Georgetown, Suriname, anywhere in the Caribbean. And that speaks to the commonality of this experience globally at this point in time. Years ago, uh, we would not have seen so much reporting about these phenomena in developed countries. But what has happened now is that, uh, as we have been saying, uh, this is the future. Uh, up to this morning, for instance, Australia more or less reported on floods. Last year, they were talking about fires. This year, they're talking about floods because in three months they have had as much rainfall that they normally get in a year. And I think, you know, uh, I'm very happy to see three journalists from uh, developed country press. I think we should think about reporting about each other. Basically to build the feeling that, look, this is not about Charleston. This is not about the Gulf Coast in the States. This is a global phenomenon. And that we have common experience and common issues to address, to deal with the suffering that communities throughout, whether in developed or developing countries uh, are experiencing. And use this basically, and particularly when we're talking about climate justice, to start building a coalition as we've seen now, uh, whether it's developed or developing countries, uh, for voices calling for action, and particularly uh, for voices in developed countries calling for action at their administrative level to deal with the issues which is affecting us all. Uh, I have always supported the idea of, you know, whenever we talk about looking for support we look at the government level, at the highest administrative level, which only ends up with, uh, you know, photo ops, signing a memoranda, understanding, and uh, a whole set of statements that are just uh, statements of intent, but no action. But if we dig down deep and we could get, for instance, our municipalities to twin, or cities to twin, I think this would be a better platform for action oriented type of activities to address a common issue. So I think you have a challenge and an opportunity to start to build that commonality of experience between our peoples and to use this basically as a platform for action, which we've been yearning for for years. But thank you very much for the presentations but I don't want you to uh, go away from there. I think we need to start reporting about each other's miseries in our press. All right. Thanks for that, Dr. Truss. And you're absolutely right. It is a global issue. For us, it's a little more detrimental as it is for the Pacific Islands because our islands could actually disappear. You know, um, so it's a little more desperate for us 
And I think a lot of folks recognize you're talking about islands who have populations of 90,000, 150,000, and much larger ones with 400,000. But the truth is, we can disappear. And during Irma and Maria, we definitely saw that, you know. Um, and so that is a fear we live with every single year, especially in the hurricane season. Earthquakes, yes, but hurricanes a little more so because it impacts more of us. But Dr. Trotz, thank you for that very, very much. Um, we're moving into to closing time. So I wanted to come back to the panel and say, you know, that I sometimes wonder if the public really understands the significance of this issue. I, I really have my doubts because I, I spend a lot of time talking to, you know, family and friends, especially my son's friends, and they are young. So I'm happy we have a youth panel later. Um, and I, I don't think they get it. Not from what not from what I hear. Um, so I think some are getting it and some are not getting it. But in your opinion, do you think that our audiences really understand this? And if you tell me, no, not all of them, what do you think we need to do differently? Can we as journalists do anything differently? And I ask that because you've been doing this for years, specializing in this area. So Tony, again, I'll start with you. Yeah, Karen, I, I agree with you that I think there's a certain segment that isn't, uh, that hasn't been, hasn't been persuaded, I guess, by the events that are in front of their, before their very eyes. So I think that the, the answer is, is essentially to do what we're doing and, and but it, it, sustaining this effort to tell the story is 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 a is a challenge, and but it's it's something that we have to do as journalists. You know, I, you know, I mentioned that you know stories are stories. You know, I believe that stories really can help save the planet, and and I think that ultimately, on a deep level, stories are how human beings learn, and learn to make better decisions. They're really the gifts we give each other to live better lives. So, I guess for the planet's sake, we need we just need to keep giving these gifts. We didn't hear you, Kiran. Sorry, guys. I thought my mic, Kali, I thought you couldn't find your mic, but it was mine. <laughs> Kali, yeah. Sure. So um, I think, you know, it's it's hard to reach everyone, of course. I think that's a challenge for any news outlet, and, and especially in this industry where there's, you know, a lot of trust has been eroded between news outlets and their audiences. And so I think really prioritizing building that trust, having an open door between, you know, the audience or community you serve and your newsroom is really crucial to covering this issue and any issue, frankly. And, you know, having um, opportunities for your readership to, you know, send questions to you about what they want or need to know about, I think is a really important sort of entry point for figuring out how to cover these issues in a way that that actually resonates and reaches people. Thanks for that. Ayurala? Sure, I'll just say quickly to add to that. Um, I think that this is where local journalism can be exceptionally powerful because it, if you put yourself in the seat of a reader and you're reading reports from the major news publications every day about all the, the horrifying things happening in, in every context around the world. And then you look at climate change and just the wealth of the impacts and the magnitude of, of what climate change means for society, that's really hard to grasp. And it can feel very separate from what your community goes, goes through and what you're experiencing. So I think that local journalism, if you're taking the climate change um, looking at impacts and putting it in a local context and showing how this impacts a community, a, a neighborhood, people around you, that that can really be effective in, and we see that be effective in, in driving action, action and, and policy on a local level. Um, so I, I, would, I would say that that's, that's something where it's, it's really exciting to be a local journalist and to be doing local coverage and regional coverage and um, we have a lot of opportunity to really reach the, the people that we're not currently getting to, the audience we're not currently reaching. Thanks for that. Thank you all for taking the time. Um, Kali, Ayurala, Tony, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this with us. Um, I hope that this will not be 
an end of our part. I hope we'll cross paths very soon again. And um, on behalf of the Media Institute of the Caribbean and Open Society Foundations, and I know Steve from Pulitzer Center could not be here, but I know that he would want to thank you as well for um, doing this for us. So we wish you the best and we look forward to seeing you soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're, we're getting ready for our next panel. Um, and so before we move on, I saw a very interesting comment come in from Gail Woon, who is based in the Bahamas. Um, and we've been talking about ensuring that media, you know, also does a lot um, of collaboration and have more discussion with civil society entities um, who are driving some of the issues um, in the climate justice space. So Gail, um, I, I'm hoping that you can turn on your microphone because you made a comment that caught my attention, which is uh, we need to tell the young people the truth. And so if I can ask you to, um, to share, I'm gonna give you two minutes to share your perspective because you say you've been working in this space since 1988. Um, do you, what do you feel we might be missing? Gail, and um, we're not hearing you. Could you come closer into your microphone, please? Yeah. Okay, we're not hearing. Okay, can you hear yeah. me now? Yes, perfect. Um, Thank you. So, what I've been doing is, especially within the last fifteen years, because as far as I'm concerned, we passed the tipping point fifteen years ago. So I am not um, sugarcoating anything I tell the children. I tell them that they have to learn to adapt. They have to be resilient. And whether they go into becoming a, a politician or a scientist or an engineer, they have to do that with a view to dealing with the climate crisis that we are leaving them with. Okay, how, I mean, you've been on this journey since 1988. How has it been? How, how receptive are people to what you are trying to do? Uh, basically, I was all of my speeches and articles have been falling on deaf ears until 2019, when uh, climate change Hurricane Dorian devastated my island, covered it with 20 foot five, 25 foot high storm surge over 70% of the island caused mortality, buildings were washed away, houses were washed away, people were washed away. And after that, all of a sudden, the government and everyone and their buddy is an expert on climate change. But um, I'm going to actually leave the country because I don't want to experience another climate change hurricane like Dorian. I've been made homeless prior to Dorian three times from climate change hurricanes, and I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to do it. Well, sorry that you, that you had to make that decision, Gail, but um, thank you. I think the point you made um, was very important for somebody who has been working in this space, um, probably when some of us here were still in school. And, yeah, I'm um, sorry, I'm I, old. Uh, I'm older I, than the dinosaurs. No, no that's how I'm saying. You have the wisdom is what I'm saying. It means you haven't given up the, uh, the mission of what you've been trying to do. So I thought it was important um, for us to recognize that and for you to weigh into this discussion. Um, because there are entities like yours and people like you who um, keep this on the front burner. And I think that um, we need to ensure that we recognize that and tap into your resources, your expertise, and, and try to work I'm with you. I'm sorry, I have to go. Um, my job is calling me, but um, I'm, I'm happy that you asked me to say something. Thanks, Thank Gail. you. Thank you All very much. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, guys. So we're going to get back on to um, our, our formal agenda with our next panel discussion, which is going to be led by our vice president, founder of the Association of Caribbean Media Workers, Mr. Wesley Gibbings. Wesley, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, Jean-Michel and I just um, private messaged each other. And um, so we know family. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jean-Michel, <laughs> Bertia is, is one of the great um, Lucian's, um, so was my grandmother who was St. Lucian herself. So um, I, I, I have been in touch with the panel, my panel before, and we're looking at alternative energy 
opportunities and, and the options um, in this time of, of the climate crisis. And so how we're gonna do this is I, I, would, I would like to introduce the subject to give it a little bit of nuance and to give it a little bit of perspective, but I want to invite the panelists to, to speak um, briefly on their areas of expertise because they're coming from this question um, from this different angles. Because as we have recognized from day one, which is last week, um, though substantial attention is being paid to the question of adaptation, and Gil just spoke about adaptation in the case of, um, of the Bahamas, but in, in Caribbean wide and throughout SIDS, um, adaptation is, is earning substantial attention. Um, so it is the question of our time with respect to the climate crisis in the Caribbean. But also significant attention is also being turned to mitigation measures, however minuscule their actual significance at the global level. This again and again uh, has earned our attention as a question of proportionality, because we're looking at climate justice. Proportionality, both among countries in the global community and within our borders. So it's not only a matter of the relationships between our countries and other countries of the world, but even within our borders across different sectors and communities. The, the fact of the matter is the climate crisis is affecting us in different and uneven ways, even within our borders. We can call all of this in a sense, and, I, and I've said it before um, in our sessions last week, we can, we can call it in essence, a question of social injustice. That's a broad philosophical approach, the broad philosophical expression. But today we are looking at equity issues with specific reference to the climate crisis. All our SIDS in the Caribbean, the Pacific, the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, and South China Seas contribute a grand total of, and we've said somebody called the figure before. 1% of all emissions that are causing concern on our planet, 1%. And if we focus only on the Caribbean, our share is minuscule. It's, it's very, very small. So yes, adaptation comes front and center, uh, but even that, even through that, if you look at it, look at the question of mitigation via our nationally determined contributions, which we, we meet at the COP and we agree to, and we debate and we discuss, um, you know, our, our share, our, our contribution to global mitigative measures really um, can be very small. So I think there's a question of, so what's in it for us really? And I think that among the measures that the, that the current situation brings is, the embrace of all renewable energy, the sources of renewable energy, as part of a larger, larger strategy to achieve what one might want to describe as energy sovereignty. I think that the mitigative um, measures that we, that we take in the Caribbean at the top of that, the priorities, because our contribution to, to the global scenario is, is minuscule, but we look, we need to to look at this challenge within the context of the opportunity for, um, and this term is, is used in a lot of other quarters, the, the whole notion of energy sovereignty. This to me represents an opportunity in the face of, of, of overwhelming challenge, a golden opportunity if you want to call it, if you want to call it that. It is true that there'll be an initial reliance on external resources of technological and financial support because clearly they, it, it, we, we are not, um, resource rich to the extent where we can execute all of this on our own at the start, but it is an investment that this region needs to make. So this panel is designed to help us understand how we get from where we are, reliant on unsustainable methods of powering our development. How are we, this is a big question for us, for us. how do we propose to power our development? within the context of the global move to, to, toward more um, renewable resources, energy resources. So our three contributors come to this question from different but cross-cutting perspectives. They are Jean-Michel Pal of the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. I think it's CCRE, it's 
popularly known as, Mark Rabin of Portable Electric in Canada. And he's coming to this question from the private sector perspective. And Dr. Neville Trotz, who is former science advisor to the, to the CARICOM Climate Change Center in Belize. And he has been with us from day one and we truly appreciate your presence, um, Dr. Trotz. So for the opening statements, I'll set up my own, that's my opening salvo. And that's about the most I will see on this panel. I want to invite Jean-Michel now to deliver his opening statement. Thank you, Wesley. Um, all right, so first off, I'll start by saying thank you, uh, personal thank you on my behalf for having me here today and thanks on behalf of Secret, of course. Um, I noted from the bios and you know when you sent me the information for this panel initially that I'm an esteemed company today, which you've just uh, you just reviewed the panelists and you know I'm among some heavyweights. I'm honored to be here discussing these important topics today with everybody. Today, my goal is to try and add value from my area of expertise, which is uh, pretty much power sector planning and projects. Uh, which I now do from my home at a regional institution uh, with a mandate for the development of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. So I hope I can bring some perspectives to bear, which will be of use to the practitioners in the room today. Uh, Wesley, you gave me a, a heads up a few days out of, of this prompt. And to be honest, <laughs> I felt somewhat challenged to develop an opening statement to fit into, I think it was a seven to 10 minute slot, which can effectively address such a, um, well, what some people have been calling the greatest challenge the world is facing today. Um, so I sort of defaulted to the, the position I like to take and which I espouse a lot in my job, which is just a bit to focus on process planning and essentially uh, effectively empowering people. So I'll start with that message and it'll probably be something that I'll weave through my responses today. Um, you know, as we go through the questions and answers, I can speak to more specifically in different uh, different times. One of the things I feel is that this is an, uh, an excellent platform. It looks like a, an, an excellent um, conference and set of sessions. However, always limited in time and the ability to cover um, the tremendous amount of material we have to. So wherever possible, I like to leave people with a way that they can delve in deeper, they can um, get to the root of the, the issue themselves, and they can actually contribute to solutions. So I just made a few bullet points I'll walk through quickly. Um, you know, a lot of people say the science is clear. Um, that's a statement you hear often. <laughs> which essentially means that we understand the issue we're facing. Um, you know, I, I don't know the full audience in the room or everybody's capabilities, but it can sometimes be what I think is somewhat of a flippant or reductionist statement, um, given that people come to this issue from different backgrounds and different levels of expertise. So I'd say first, I mean, there's tremendous amount of information out there. Feel free to educate yourself on this topic and the challenge we're facing. Um, you know, a simple point towards the IPCC documentation and synthesis documents is a, is a great start. Um, but my next point, which, you know, I saw somebody else raise in public recently with some of the release of some of the new documents from IPCC, which is how to approach it. Because these, um, to be honest, some of the, the documents, they're lengthy, they're comprehensive, which is great, but they're not always easily approachable from a layperson's perspective. And some of the simpler documents really are more, I guess, policymaker oriented. So I'd say don't be afraid to approach these issues, understanding the challenges and what we face from your own perspective and something you care about. I mean, it could be your island. I caught the end of a session there um, just a while ago with a lady speaking from the Bahamas. Um, it could be a hobby, it could be your family, your field of work, um, and understand what the impacts will be to that or to you. Um, and then you can take it from there and sort of delve in deeper and deeper and deeper as you go. Now that you have the background and you've zoomed into an area of interest, hopefully that hooks you. I think some of the challenges I have, I come from energy, and I find that speaking energy with friends and family can be challenging. I think actually the climate discourse has... Um, brought more people to the table and, and willing to speak about what's going on, um, energy can still be hard. But now that you've had something to hook you and you understand the impacts and the challenges, zoom in a bit closer. And I think this is critical for this discussion because um, there are different perspectives we'll take. And I guess we'll explore that as they through the discussion, but there's that big picture which you started with. And you know, once you start to talk about elements of justice, we're zooming now into people. Um, 
you know, you, you may have realized the cause, the impacts, and, you know, some of the solutions that are just generally espoused. But, um, you know, we have to start looking at some of the deeper questions, which, you know, a session like this will explore. The scene is a vast one, and there's a long thread between, you know, the people who are, the people who are most responsible or responsibility in general for this problem, Wesley, you touch on some of this, and the people who is going to impact the individuals and impact them in different ways. So you, at, at different points, you just have to reframe your perspective and understand how the problem affects different people. And lastly, armed with all of that, you can you know, reframe to, to solutions and, and look at how you might um, either educate people to you know, move towards the support of solutions or do it yourself. And you know, I'll, I'll end here. I don't want to drone on too long. I, I think I'm still within your, your, your time, Wesley, but I'll, I'll end by just saying it's a session on justice. So I want to leave with that idea of people. And I think we'll, we'll come back to that a few times during the session. Um, lots of perspectives we can offer and lots of material and lots of facts and lots of some of them scary. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'd like to leave you with that process to be able to dig in deeper and, you know, start to incorporate this in some of your work. Some of you may have already, and some of you may well be climate experts beyond, beyond my capacity. Um, but yeah, I, I like this idea of process, being able to understand the problem, um, dig in deeper, reframe, offer several perspectives, incorporate into your work and broadcast, broad, broadcast this in a simple way to a wider audience so we can all contribute to solutions. Thanks, Wesley. Thanks a lot for that, um, Jean Michel. And, uh, and you, you referenced the IPCC documents in the, the last review document, um, and I was able to do a, a scan of it. Uh, you know, mentioned um, climate justice, questions of justice and equity, almost 400 times. This is a substantive document. Um, the, 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 the summary that was put out for policymakers, um, you know, mentioned it multiple times as well. So, uh, in here in the Caribbean, where there's a high level of vulnerability and where there is both the, the duty of adaptation and also the requirement of mitigation, I think that um, this is, it's natural that we look at the equity issues and the extent to which communities, sectors, and different groups of people within our communities actually pay the price um, or the pay the cost of what we're facing. Um, now, you, what you've said um, you know, is a perfect intro for Mark um, who is coming um, from this from a, a different perspective. You operate within the intergovernmental sphere. Uh, Mark operates in, in the private sector. So Mark, over to you, let's hear from you. Thank you, Wesley, and good morning, everybody. Uh, so first I wanna thank, thank you everybody here for, for being a part of this very important discussion. And I think it's, um, I'm gonna come at it from a, a bit of a different lens uh, in, in terms of this. Now, I do wanna apologize, I have not, listened in on the previous discussions. So I, you know, if I'm repeating anything in my preamble, I, I do apologize for that. Uh, but it's part of, the, part of the sort of the idea that I have here and when Wesley and I discussed uh, how to approach this. I, I'm coming at this from a lens of, I'm an earth scientist, I'm a geologist by trade. So I, I understand earth systems. I've got a master's in energy economics, um, which is, you know, that kind of blew the doors wide open on understanding what's really happening in the planet. Uh, and then I, I'm an energy entrepreneur in a sense where I realized that the policy mechanisms that we have today on the planet are way, way too slow and outdated. And in fact, you know, we hear this, don't want to rock the boat, right? You hear that a lot. Well, the boat sunk a while back. We're in a life raft. And so this is the sort of the angle that we have to take. And that's where I'm going to start my, my preamble. I do have notes here, uh, but I'll, I'll see how it goes. But the one thing for sure, it's clear that climate change means like more erratic and catastrophic events everywhere in the world. So it's not just limited to the global South, but it's, it's everywhere. Um, and the trend isn't stopping. You know, this 1.5 degrees Celsius climate target ceiling, I believe is completely laughable. It's a joke. Um, you know, it's, it's there to make, make people feel better about trying to do something. And, and I think we're blowing right past that. And, and the reality is, is what does 1.5 degrees even mean? So, and, and let's be honest, like the Caribbean and countless other regions in the global South will bear the brunt of climate change. And we're not just talking climate justice, we're talking racial justice, social justice, technological justice. The Caribbean region is an opportunity, has an opportunity to leapfrog many jurisdictions and become ground zero for the deployment of new technologies to help support 
and rebuild resilient communities in the aftermath of natural disasters? Why not orient the funding organizations, the banks, disaster response dollars, et cetera, towards aggressive adaptation strategies and funding mechanisms, get the whole region on board, working as a collective for change and innovation and leveraging the best and greatest technologies on the planet today, right? Easier said than done, but that's why we're here to discuss this today. We have the technology today to make this happen, right? It's never gonna be perfect, right? There's always gonna be a better technology. There's always gonna be better batteries. There's always gonna be something more innovative in the, down the road, but that's not an excuse for not doing anything today. So I always say it's like, it's easy to talk ourselves out of it, you know, and stay in this almost like toxic cycle of disaster after disaster, barely keeping our heads above water and then waiting for the next climate catastrophe to get those dollars to flow, right? And who knows where those dollars are going also in that, that type of, you know, it's the polluting countries that are coming back and saying, oh, well, here's a few extra bucks. Sorry, here's a few extra bucks, right? That's not a sustainable model for the future. We need to hold governments accountable, both North and South, insurance companies, banks, international climate and disaster relief organizations, right? They need to be held accountable. And let's invest upfront in regenerative, resilient infrastructure, work on technology sharing partnerships. Again, I come back to this point. We have the technology today to do this, right? And it's actually gonna be more cost effective in the long run to invest today. Additionally, leveraging the burgeoning global carbon offset and carbon credit markets have the opportunity to fund clean energy technology and infrastructure. New funding mechanisms such as distributed renewable energy credits or DRECs, where credits can be pre-sold to fund and deploy new build distributed renewable energy infrastructure. It's just one of the many new and exciting avenues to tackle climate justice and get new technologies deployed at a wartime-like effort. Also, portable and mobile infrastructure, redeployable infrastructure needs to be part of the initial response in the aftermath of a natural disaster. You know, just throwing a bunch of generators out there, uh, you, you're, you know, you've got the fuel supply chain, you've got a bunch of batteries. It just turns into a Home Depot waste stream after a natural disaster. That's not sustainable, right? So we need to leverage global organizations and work in partnership you know, with the Caribbean and Global South to help set the stage for accelerated innovation and pioneering new funding mechanisms to enable the deployment of renewable energy technologies. So my angle is talk is cheap, execution is everything. How do we work together to get this going as quickly as possible and make and have the Caribbean as a ground zero for innovation, of new and exciting technologies in the world today? Thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Mark. Um, you know, some very um, provocative um, comments, but a lot of which uh, I am sure Dr. Trotz, who was at the forefront of the 1.5 to stay alive um, campaign, would agree with. Uh, you know, so Dr. Trotz, I'm turning over to you. Is, 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 are we gone past sloganeering on 1.5 and are we in the ra life raft? And now having to row ashore um, on our own strength, and if so, how do we how do we achieve that, Dr. Trotz? I wonder if he dropped off. Which would yes, be I had dropped out for a short while. Uh, I'm I'm not going to put on my video because I'm having some network problems. But anyway, okay, hi, good, good morning. Uh, the the whole issue of uh, of climate justice. <laughs> Sorry. All right, <laughs> I have to change venue. I'm in my bedroom now. <laughs> okay. The whole issue of climate justice. Uh, you know, it's uh, when they we negotiated the uh, the convention. Uh, it seems to have been clear cut. The whole call for common but differentiated responsibility addressed the fact that there are, we can point fingers as to why and who 
in terms of the crisis we face. And we can point fingers at those who basically are part of this whole experience, but because of geographical situation, because of uh, social issues, poverty, uh, they are at the receiving end of the impacts of uh, climate change. And so as we move forward, uh, the question of attribution was, was clear. And this is why in the convention, we had negotiated that those responsible as developed countries should be providing resources for us as developing countries without access to technology, without access to the financial resources, cannot do anything about building our uh, climate resilience. So that's where the whole question of uh, climate justice uh, under the climate change umbrella uh, begins. Uh, for 30 years, we've been struggling to get resources. Uh, a few years ago in Cancun, uh, there was this notional sort of indication that we will have 100 billions per year for mitigation and for adaptation, mind you. Uh, this sounds like a big figure, but really it's a drop in the bucket when you look at the resources that we re really require. But even this modest uh, amount, uh, up to now, we haven't been able to realize that uh, in terms of resources available for uh, action. So resources, resources, resources is at the at the at the at the heart of the of this issue, uh, giving us the ability to build cry, uh, uh, climate resilience and to and to protect ourselves. Uh, in the mitigation sector, it's not bad because uh, investment in transformation of the architecture of our energy sector uh, basically pays back for itself. So you have a very high, as one would expect, private sector uh, presence in uh, the mitigation side of the coin. But when we come to adaptation, uh, if we could make a case for uh, investment in uh, a public good that will redound to the profitability of the private sector, then we would see the private sector there. Even though under the negotiations at this point in time, there is an attempt to shift the focus from concessionary loans, from grants to, to, to loans uh, for adaptation, which is something that we've been thoroughly uh, resisting. So as we, for the Caribbean, I mean, it's not because we are this high moral fiber that we are talking about uh, renewable energy. The simple fact is that the architecture of our energy sector in the Caribbean at this point in time is not sustainable. Uh, we are one of the highest energy intensive regions in the world, which makes our manufacturing or services uh, expensive and uncompetitive. So it is in our interest to transform. So this is an opportunity under this uh, umbrella for zero carbon uh, in 2050 for us to transform uh, the energy sector. And Wesley, I'd like to introduce uh, an interesting concept in climate justice. Uh, now that we have two big uh, producers in Suriname and in Guyana, in the Caribbean. Uh, the question is, uh, there is a call, you know, to keep uh, those resources in the ground. Uh, but when you look at it, this is the only way that these countries are going to generate resources to adapt and to mitigate at the rate that we are required to, to meet the zero carbon uh, uh, level in 2050. Uh, and so the argument is, uh, you know, should we, Saudi Arabia and uh, USA and Norway, 
continue to uh, produce while we close off our taps and continue to wait on handouts. I think that would be suicide as far as we're concerned. And there's an opportunity here. Uh, basically, I, I, it is suggested that what really should happen is that you know all producers should come together and agree on a metric that would more or less show the way in terms of how they allocate production until fossil fuel is uh, going to be phased out. Fossil fuel is going to be part of the equation as we move towards 2050. So who produces? Uh, that's uh, a question. And uh, again, uh, you don't want to see poor developing countries uh, more or less muscled out of that arena and not able to derive resources for their own transformation uh, as we move forward. Uh, in the region, I, I you know, think we have a splendid opportunity uh, to internalize our energy needs as we move towards 2050. That is Suriname, Guyana, Trinidad, providing the fossil fuel that is required regionally for the transformation, much more than that. For them, through the, the resources that they generate, to invest some of those resources to help our Caribbean countries to transform to net zero in 2050. In other words, the investment that goes into that transformation doesn't come from the usual sources, but it's internalized for the benefit of the Caribbean. And as we transform, uh, the, uh, on the first day, Steve spoke about just transition. This is something as we change over, we need to ensure that the sort of disparities and disadvantages that we see with the present uh, system aren't more or less uh, repeated. There are other issues, this uh, nature-based solution, uh, they're putting forests and whatnot into the uh, equation, uh, monetizing, but are the people who own, some of them who are caretakers over the years, for these resources, are they at the table when decisions are being made as to how uh, these these uh, these negotiations would go forward? So that's my piece, uh, Wesley, and open now for discussion. Well, th thanks a lot for that. Uh, again, you know, like Jean Michel and, and Mark before you, you put quite a lot on the table and uh, but one of the things that 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 that, that strikes me through all of this you know um that there there's so many shifting um poles in all of this it's not a static situation as we go ahead for example you know now europe is looking at at renewables far more urgently now given the fact of the the, the ukraine war uh and and the fact that they will be starved of of of, of natural gas supplies on that kind of stuff in the Caribbean here, you know, uh, Dr. Trotz, you spoke about Ga 10 years ago, Guyana was, was going to speak the same language. Guyana is speaking a completely different language now with respect to the exploitation of, of, um, of, um, of, of hydrocarbons. Um, Trinidad and Tobago is, is, is changing its language because of the shifts in focus between oil to gas and now because of shortages and, and, and well, prices have changed. So it's, it's, it's not a static situation. But I think that what is constant is the requirement to, to, to invest and reinvest in, 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 in those resources that will help us become more and more self-reliant and, and sovereign, as I said, this notion of energy sovereignty. Jean-Michel, uh, I, I know you're here wearing a Sikri hat, but from your professional perspective, do you think that the region has been putting the best use um, with particular emphasis on this question of, 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 of energy and energy sovereignty um, it, to, to, to use or, or have we been paying attention our priorities have been have been in the wrong direction and we need to 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 recalibrate and come again mark i'm coming to you because i see mark itching to, to, to come in on this question jean michel you first yeah, I don't know if I should um, take off or leave on my secret hat to answer this one. Um, but I'll start by saying, to be honest, Wesley, I, I 
personally, I've been a little disappointed about um, the region's transition to date. I think, and I'll build off Dr. Trotz's um, response or part of it, where he said it isn't um, necessarily, and I, I suppose he meant exclusively, a, a moral positioning to start to integrate these things and participate in the transition. You know, it. I think in the early days, it was a little bit of a, a harder sell, admittedly, um, but I think we've left those days long behind. These technologies stand on their own merit now on pricing, on capability. What I advise people who sometimes tend to harp on some of the, the challenges that exist or that are inherent, like the variability perhaps of, of wind and solar is that um, leveraging the technology for our uses, in this case, power generation, it's, it's Every technology has pluses and minuses. I think the most important thing is understanding the characteristics, the techno-economic characteristics of the technology you're trying to leverage and their clear benefits. And to be honest, I'd say there's a minimal disadvantage in starting to integrate these technologies into our systems, particularly at, at lower levels of penetration. That's not to say they're not challenges to be solved and, uh, you know, clearly fix my secret hat on here and say that that is why we advocate for um, data-driven planning. We advocate for analyses to underpin the direction we have to go in, the plans we set to move forward, um, and the program that I participate in and, and in some respects um, help lead. It That's its raison d'etre, that's its, its purpose. I mean, the Integrated Resource and Resilience Planning Program that the center um, is, is advocating, um, and as well, some of the regional leadership is advocating for. It really, these are plans we can use, not exclusively the only ones, but we think very valuable plans we can use to set this course going forward, perform these analyses, allay concerns. As part of this process, we have a strong capacity building perspective and educational and support perspective because we realize, to be honest, there's, there's, there are a lot of um, ideas about the transition, ideas about integration of these technologies that are, um, should be long disposed of and are no longer applicable. Um, but I think the best way forward is to get everybody at the table, um, develop these participatory plans, have everything informed by data, perform the analyses, and have something on paper that shows you that these are clear benefits. Um, and I'm sure Mark will jump on the point that this doesn't only show you internally, it doesn't only uh, lay policymakers in your country, but it's also uh, you know, a good signal that if you want to um, develop your sector using various mechanisms, including the, the, the invitation of, of private sector, that uh, there's no better way than having a plan that you can coalesce around and use that as a basis for invitation um, and, and proper development of the sector. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jean-Michel. Mark. Amen, Jean-Michel. <laughs> um, you know, I, I echo everything that, that you just said. Um, and again, I go back to this, not doing anything is no longer an excuse, right? And yeah, you know, there are many riches to be had from finding new hydrocarbon uh, resources, right? And there's no question that uh, even here in Canada, we're having the same discussion, right, around these, these resources. Uh, but again, it's not a, I, I don't think anybody here on this panel is saying, you know, walk away from those resources and uh, we're all just going to go on uh, solar and batteries here. No, that's not the issue. Uh, the issue, though, is I agree is around the master planning, getting the data. Um, it's easy to go back on, you know, what we are comfortable with. And of course, the oil and gas industry, which is one of the largest industries in the world, it moves 100 million barrels a day around the globe and is very, very powerful um, and, and very lucrative for governments as well. And it also brings a lot of corruption with it and resource curse, which is, you know, we talk about what is energy sovereignty. Well, someone says, well, we find oil and gas. Uh, now we're sovereign. Energy security, well, yeah, it depends, right? Depends how you look at it. There's a definitely many, many instances of, of countries that have, that have become extremely resource cursed from finding uh, natural resources like that. Uh, however, my take is, is we need a plan to leverage the, the bounty of oil and gas then, and, and then directly funding new technologies and new innovation and really doing like, you know, the heritage funds or sovereign wealth funds like, uh, like Norway has done 
uh, to then reinvest in new technologies uh, and do that. So, and I also think, again, I come back to this idea, why not start to come up with that master plan where we're starting to, to put plans in place and say, okay, this region, we're going to make this thing a, a technology park or sort of technology proving ground so that we can go and showcase the new technologies that are out there. And you know what? Private industry and governments around the world would, would clamor at that opportunity to showcase the best technologies in, in renewable technologies. And again, keeping in mind that our future energy systems are hybridized. Like there is, there's no silver bullet here. It's not we're to wake up one day and, and, you know, magic perpetual energy machine. No, it's going to be a hybrid of the best technologies of the day where the wind blows, you put wind, where the sun shines, you put sun, where you have some hybrid generation and co-generation, you have that as well. So I think it's going to be a combination, but again, to talk ourselves out of that is, is the crime here today. And I think that I look at the Caribbean region and it's just an incredible opportunity to be a, a proving ground for new technologies, and that should be the position. Uh, Dr. Trotz, Mark raised the issue of employ the employment of sovereign funds. Uh, and you, uh, Mark, you would know that in Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana, uh, where, where you, Guyana you have a, a fledgling industry, but a rapidly growing one, um, there is this discussion, and, and there actually are sovereign funds. Dr. Trotz, in your messaging to the Caribbean governments over the years, is this the kind of thinking that has been promoted that, okay, in addition to the external funding and resources that are absolutely necessary, that there ought to be a, a high level of reinvestment, particularly from those of us who have entered the energy sector or and those who have been longstanding, Trinidad and Tobago, we've been in the energy industry for over a hundred years. Uh, yet you, you can see that there was never any serious emphasis on developing an alternative path just in the event, as is the case now, you run into shortages, you run into market conditions that are depressing prices and so on. Uh, Dr. Trotz, over the years, have you seen, have you witnessed this kind of resolve or have people um, just sort of sunk back into a state of complacency and said, okay, we weren't responsible for this. So th those of you who were guilty, um, keep the funds flowing and, and that's, what, that's what that, and there's no focus on reinvesting. Leslie, there's so many sides to that uh, question. I want to start by saying that uh, for us in the Caribbean, I don't think there's going to be a problem with the energy sector. As I said, there's sound economic reason for that, for that uh, transformation. And it's, it's going to happen and it's going to happen at a pace that I think uh, is required. Uh, uh, for instance, I mean, I wonder how many people know in this region that one of the biggest cost lines in the uh, budgets of uh, the water companies is energy that is used for the distribution. I think our water sector knows that now and they're gung-ho for uh, transformation. Uh, so as far, I, I agree with Mark, uh, you know, about the opportunity that we have uh, in the uh, energy sector. Uh, in the 80s, when there was a spike in oil prices, some of our countries had to fork out as much as 52% of their foreign earnings, basically just to pay for fossil fuel. Totally unsustainable. So I don't think you have to make a case for that transformation in the Caribbean. Uh, our problem has been access to the sort of resources that we will require for the transformation to take place at the pace at which uh, it should. The other side of the coin really is the adaptation side. We have to simultaneously build climate, climate resilience. We, we have to, re we have to uh, look at our coral reefs, we have to look at our mangroves, we have to look at so many other things. Ironically, uh, you mentioned the sovereign fund in, in Norway. Guyana now is paid by Norway to conserve parts of its forest. But where is that money coming from? It's from Norway's oil revenues. Now we are in a situation in Suriname and Guyana with those oil revenues 
to accelerate the pace at which we both mitigate and reach the 2050 target and build climate resilience adapt. So it's an opportunity. Let's take an uh, example of our uh, of agriculture. Uh, we basically need to have a change in our uh, our system. We have a plan for Guyana, Suriname, Belize to be like the food basket of the Caribbean and internalize a lot of the, uh, the, the, the resources that we need for self-sufficiency in agriculture, uh, self-sufficiency in food security. Uh, but we don't have the resources. There's an opportunity, for instance, for the natural gas and uh, the Wesley, the, the facility you have uh, not operating now for manufacture of uh, fertilizers to internalize that whole uh, system for the benefit of the whole uh, Caribbean until such time that we don't have to depend on, uh, on the fossil fuels. So add into rim uh, in terms of the pace at which this transformation is concerned, this is where those resources become important. Interestingly enough, Norway, uh, a few months ago, made the statement that fossil fuel is going to be part of the equation as we phase out uh, fossil fuels uh, to 2050, and that Norway will be looking at increasing uh, our production to take full advantage of, of that market. So why should we poor developing countries sit on the sideline and basically depend, continue to uh, depend uh, on handouts? Uh, if our resources are utilized to more, of, more or less invest in our agriculture, in our more or less, uh, What's the word I need now uh, with the economy? Anyway, uh, towards uh, sustaining our sustaining, towards achieving our sustainable development goals with balanced development, uh, uh, diversifying uh, our, our economy, uh, then, you know, that's the argument we need. But the energy sector, I am very, I'm very uh, encouraged by the amount of research that has gone in to address things like uh, storage uh, and possibly the use of hydrogen, which Barbados is all, uh, already talking about. I think in the Caribbean, that is going to move. And I think apart from everything else, access to the resources is the urgency that these countries need uh, in terms of the economics uh, of uh, of fossil fuel. Thanks a lot, Dr. Trotz. Um, again, uh, if any of the journalists or others on on the on the, in the audience want to pose any questions, make any comments, uh, Steve Maximi said a lot earlier on in the conversation that well, he is sort of discouraging um, me from making too much of a huge distinction between adaptation needs and the benefits of, of mitigation. Um, mitigation, he says, can be an interesting fillip to adaptation. We should mitigate our advantage and not necessarily as part of a global effort. Steve, you want to say more about that or do any of the panelists want to address that question? I could jump in very quickly there. Uh, it's a simple equation. <clears throat> One of the reasons right now why we can't invest in adaptation is because we're spending so much money uh, uh, keeping our fossil fuel habit alive. And the argument is that should the governments be freed of that uh, overwhelming bill, then they have many more options in terms of utilization of those resources for adaptation. So it's, uh, it's, it's Steve is right in the button. Um, Mark, you, you're, you're from a country that's oh, a fossil fuel junkie. Um, 
Uh, okay, but let, let me hear from Steve first before. Yeah. So that people will have to think about that one, Mark. Just, just in defense of, of the point, and the example I use most often is, let's say, Antigua, where you're talking about adaptation in Antigua. Adaptation in Antigua has to do with how do you get past sea level rise, drought. You look at Potworks, uh, Potworks Dam in Antigua, major source of water, potable water. If you have now a larger, deeper saltwater lens, I can see a mitigation project that says we are going to desal using solar energy as being an interesting flip in terms of how you adapt by using mitigation and funding from through the mitigation angle. That's all. That's 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 where, where my head was at as, as far as that was concerned. So that mitigation and adaptation can overlap and can be, as I said, an interesting flip in terms of adaptation. Thanks. Yeah, and, and just to take one step further, the other thing too is, you know, some of the technology may not be the right fit per se. You know, it's going to be the local and regional environments and, and te technologists that are going to potentially take and adapt those technologies for, you know, use cases in specifically the Caribbean region or other regions. So, I, I you know, I also think, you know, if we know that there's a hurricane season coming through every year, then you have to harden your infrastructure, right? If you're going to put solar, you know, build out solar desalination, then you have to make sure that that solar infrastructure can withstand strong winds, right, up to a certain amount. Uh, so again, these are just, you know, for me, I keep coming back around to, um, you know, there's not a one size fits all solution, but we have to leverage the best and brightest minds in the Caribbean region, the best technology that's coming from Europe, North America, Asia, and so on, to to then roll that out and and find it. We have to we have to do pilot projects that are meaningful. And this is again, I keep coming back to this. It's like we we have to start to find new mechanisms and new ways to fund this equipment, fund the stuff, and do pilot projects. And what I found in terms of my business, in terms of innovation, sometimes it takes two, three times. Sometimes your first project doesn't hit the mark and you got to recalibrate. So, you know, these are the discussions that I think are important to be having. And then, you know, I'm interested to hear back from Jean, Jean Michel on like, you know, how do we actually start to implement these things in, in that master plan? And, you know, where those are the sort of the questions that I have. It's like, look, we know this is happening. How do, how do we actually advance this in a meaningful way as quickly as possible with that classic kind of wartime retooling? Zidia, I'm coming I'm to you, Pepper, you Michael. This, this issue of time, because we, that's an alarm bell for us. The last uh, 1.5 report, and certainly from the IPCC report that just came out, and Leslie mentioned this uh, the first day we, we had this uh, discussion, that urgency, Time is running out. We don't have too much time, basically, in which to address uh, these issues. Uh, pilot projects, we've had a lot of pilot projects ready for scaling up in the Caribbean, but yet we can't convince the funding agencies to accelerate our access to funds for that type of scaling up. And we can't get the level of funding uh, for that scaling up. Just a quick anecdote. Uh, we were in Washington, uh, New York after a very active hurricane season in the Caribbean. And all of our uh, government representatives spoke about the same destruction of their solar energy arrays until we came to the end when the Cubans made a presentation. So oh, that's not a problem for us. We have designed them in such a way that when we get the warning of a storm, we can take them down, store them, and then put them back. A simple solution, you know, but there are solutions around. And uh, I think this calls for much more sort of interaction between the different players so that best practice can be uh, more or less highlighted as, as we move along. Jean-Michel, that ball has landed in your garden. Um, yeah, what kind of discussion is happening regionally on these kinds of questions? 
that's that's great if you don't mind i'll just follow up on some of the ideas and then i'll answer that question wesley so um well dr trotz took one of the points directly out of my mouth but building off um mark's contribution you know i think the, it is very true that we need to make sure that the solutions are purpose built and fit to our environment and our context um and i think that requires two things and it's building straight off um dr trotz's anecdote which is that we need to upskill, reskill, and um, empower, build capacity in the region um, for us to be able to take these things. You know, honestly, <laughs> and unfortunately, but I, I don't know when that will change as a region. Um, we are somewhat takers, particularly of technology, but I think we have, um, you know, a great opportunity to tailor it to um, our environment and ensure that, again, it's fit for purpose and it works. Um, and, but I think the only way that can be achieved is by um, ensuring that the capacity is there in the region to be able to do that and, and, and facilitate that translation and ensure that when it's put here, it works. We're not just adapting something from North America and plopping it on the ground. Two, I think we need to work regionally. So, you know, this question of pilot projects, this question of what others are doing. If we don't work regionally, it's a waste of our time and our resources because we, we at risk of um, undertaking the same steps and missteps and learning by ourselves. It's a waste for us to try to attempt these things in small islands with, with limited resources, a point that's come up several times in this, um, and not learning from each other and being able to um, you know, leapfrog and move ahead quicker as a region. Um, so those are two things I, I, I advocate strongly, working together regionally and, um, and, and building our skills. Um, and just to the anecdote specifically as well, I'd like to say, you know, there is a lot of information out. Then again, it goes back to my previous point of just understanding what's out there. And this is why, I, you know, I, it's, a, it's a side part of the work we do, but I really enjoy helping to build capacity of others in the region because there is a lot of information and research going on out there now about um, PV systems, just to take one, under storm conditions. And there are, are ways and empirical um, you know, reports and studies that have been done to figure out how we can enhance the resilience of these systems once they're on the ground. And these are things we have to drive. Again, if we just bring in an, an EPC company or somebody and ask them to put a solar down for us, chances are high they're not going to consider these things. Some of the things they'll have to do to the system will require additional time. Some will require additional cost. These things have to be driven by us to ensure that once the system is brought down, it works for our purposes. Um, and then lastly, to your point, Wesley, I think you asked what's happening on a regional level. Um, was that your question? Just to be clear. Yep. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I mean, I can speak from Secret, and again, I'd speak more um, power sector oriented. And it ties back into this conversation. But again, the program I'm part of, it has a bit of a dual focus. So it's traditional planning and power sector planning. But the secondary focus or uh, what we try and bring to bear is this idea of building resilience as well. Um, now, granted, it is resilient to the power sector, but the interlinkages with everything else going on in, um, you know, any given country and in the region. So I think somebody mentioned collaboration, and that's a great point. So we have to ensure that when we're looking to build resilience to the power sector, some countries have already gone the direction of um, doing overall risk analysis for the country, resilience plans for the country, that these things are aligned. Um, two, where some countries have climate change centers, offices of climate change, um, agencies which focus on that when we're examining how these systems are going to work in the future and be resilient to the effects of climate change, um, adapting to it, we need to ensure that these things mesh. We need to ensure that, um, you know, there's a two-way flow between our ambitious goals to, I guess, join this um, effort of mitigation, although we've, we have this context about our limited role in it, really. Um, but still contribute in our own different, differentiated way to, to you know, solving the problem of climate change. Um, and at the same time, taking the analysis from the sector and what it says we can do with the sector in terms of helping to decarbonize, Dr. Trott said it, um, I also think we will get there by 2050 um, within the region and feeding into those plans as well. So we know what we're really capable of doing and it's underpinned by data and analysis. So that's kind of what's happening in the region and where I think we need to keep pushing ahead. So I mean, I'm talking from a pro programmatic perspective, one program, but I think we need to make sure that all our programs have these interlinkages. They're aware of what um, others are doing. There's greater collaboration between um, agencies within the countries and in the region as well. So. That's a little bit on that. Glad you Michael. Um, Zidi has had a hand up for a little while. Zidi, what's the point or question you want to um, oh, I'm focus not, on? 
ask, I'm going to ask a question, but I, it's, a, it's going to be a little bit of rambling. Um, okay, so 20, 2003, we were invited to the Holy See to look at their solar array. At, by that time, they had already converted their systems and they were using panels that trap the sun to get the, the energy. And um, I came back to the Caribbean and I asked the question, what are we doing? And at that time, we were still paying GCT here in Jamaica on panels, um, if there were that many. But as, I'm, I'm saying that to say that, I mean, even with Secree, when you call them up and you say, what is happening? They want permission from the boss to be able to say something to you. I mean, we're journalists and we understand the reason why you want to keep some things to your chest. But yeah. a lot of what happens in the environment and in climate change has to come from the ground up. We as the people, the journalists, talking to the people to push what is happening. Jamaica's had this um, biodigester technology for years and very few people even use it. But we still put up these um, massive sewage system that pumps gallons and gallons out of wastewater that is not used in any way. You know, that sort of thing. So um, I'm saying that to ask what level of research is there? Because you, you Jean-Michael, is that how you say your name, Jean-Michael? Um, Jean-Michel, Jean 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 but that's fine. No problem. Jean <laughs> okay. Michel, oh yeah, see the spelling now, yeah. Um, we have, we, we, I mean, you have hardened glass for, 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 um, for, for solar panels these days. You have so many things. What kind of research are we doing in the, in, in the space that will allow us to go and say, okay, here, this is what we want to do. And here, and who are the, who are the people who can do the checks and the balances so that when we go out to do something, we don't waste our time? Thanks a lot for that, Zidi. A very relevant question, and I'm sure Mark would want to come in on this because, you know, since since my school days, we've been talking about appropriate technology. Appropriate technology. Yes, um, we 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 weren't there to, in, to invent the wheel, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. But perhaps the specifications need to be suitable to, for our environment. Mark, to what extent is reinvention part of this of this thing, or is it a matter of, of adaptation of existing technology? First, before I jump into that, um, I just want to note that you know, eighty percent of all power generation or more is from fossil fuel in the Caribbean region, depending on where you are. Right? I mean, it's you know, I just want to let that sink there for a moment because, again, these are. You know, we should be moving very, very quickly to move off of, you know, the, the stranglehold of, of refined fossil fuels to, to do basic power generation. Uh, in terms of, of the technology, uh, yeah, again, like I, I'll say, it's, it is not a one size fits all, but there are definitely you know, leading technologies that are out there. Like, for example, energy storage that we know today uh, has come leaps and bounds in the last, you know, utility scale energy storage has come leaps and bounds from from the la over the last decade or so that are now viable. And there are other types of energy storage mechanisms uh, like flow batteries, for example, they're a little more expensive uh, today, but there's, so there's technologies out there, uh, but I think we're seeing a trend globally that solar and wind are the dominant sort of renewable energy sources and, and we're scaling entire continents now are starting to, you know, again, the African continent is starting to, to come online significantly with, with resources renewable energy resources so so again i think it's not to reinvent the core technology it's not we're not going to be reinventing battery chemistry and deploying it in a you know a, a multi-megawatt array in in the caribbean but it's all the infrastructure around it the supporting infrastructure Look, what are we doing in terms of the, the poles and wires and how are we deep building our homes right i mean if we're just building big homes right at sea level, right in the ground, right in the sand that require a lot of air conditioning and so on. And every time there's a, you know, a, a wave surge, uh, the home gets flooded and overwhelmed. And then, you know, it, it's like that, like, we just can't be building the same old stuff over and over and over and over again. Like that's actually, you know, that's actually mental illness when you look at, at you know, going there and saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to rebuild right here in this floodplain. 
it just it's not feasible so i don't think it's just a technology I, the technology is one part of it it's there it exists but we, we have to look at it, you know from a sane perspective it was like how are we reorganizing our communities and where are we building these and how, and then we can start to look at you know we can build homes today that don't require you know energy for air conditioning i mean we have technology today that exists and design methods you know and competent architects in the Caribbean and around that can build homes that require very little energy. So I, I think it has to be a holistic approach to looking at, you know, again, water, food, sewage, power, uh, design of, of our communities, because without that, I mean, you could put a bunch of solar panels and batteries somewhere, but if you're running big mansions with lots of air conditioning and, you know, tin cans that have no insulation, you're screwed. We're done. Go home. Thanks for that, Mark. We have to start uh, wrapping up. I've, I've just been reminded, but Mark, you raised some very interesting questions here, and I'm sure that Dr. Trotz has some, some ideas on it, because decision-making in these things, as Dr. Trotz and what Jean-Michel would know themselves, right, because they've operated in the intergovernmental um, community, is that you know these are not all, only questions of technology and science. There's also big P politics and small P politics at the, at, the, at the local and national levels that need to, play, to be played. You talk about build, rebuilding communities in, in floodplains, that's par for the course in some of our countries. Uh, but you stand on a platform and try to say, well, you know, these entire communities need to move away from where they are um, and see the, the price that you will end up paying just, for that. Just a quick point though, uh, you know, previous generations built homes on stilts, for example, or understood that the, 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 the tide waters rose X amount of feet, right? So I'm not suggesting that entire communities need to be fully displaced, but the building methods and the design features need to be adapted to the regions and, and be, so that's maybe more clarification. Okay, uh, Zadi, just very quickly, um, because Zadi asked a question, a technical question about, about the storage. And I think that the context in which Mark spoke about storage um, is a little bit different. ZD said, do we have to wait on storage or mm. can we go ahead to install, use the power captured during the daytime and significantly reduce the load on fossil fuel? We'll Mark, a, a quick response to that before Dr. Trutz comes in. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's, again, it's not a one size fits all and, and it's, there's going to be different solutions and hybridizing with the grid already helps in any way, shape or form. Yes, Dr. Trutz. No, I just had my mic on and didn't realize it. And, and, and anyway, uh, uh, I, I should have made this point in the last panel and this discussion now uh, allows me to make it. And around this whole question of best practice, uh, there is a lot of best practice going on right throughout the region, but it doesn't see the light of day. And I make the point because I think uh, we, as a, a journalist uh, fraternity and sorority, they should, uh, this is a role that they can play. Basically getting out into the public domain, uh, examples of best practice. People learn from that. Uh, we, uh, Zadie was talking just now about wastewater. And right now, hopefully, the GCF is going to approve a project, another project for the Barbados Water Authority, which includes dealing with the sewage treatment problems on the South Coast and using the wastewater generated at, during that process uh, for recycling into agriculture. So the ideas are there, the activities are taking place, I think it's important that uh, our populace knows about these uh, initiatives and that alone can spur action in areas with, uh, similar, with similar issues. Just a quick word. Uh, for years, you know, my colleague, Professor Binger, uh, has been pushing the idea of ocean thermal energy conversion uh, in the Caribbean, which has tremendous potential because from energy, uh, you get a water benefit, uh, you, you get a 
benefit for uh, exotic agriculture, abalone or something like that. Anyway, uh, if you look around, there's not so much research external to uh, the region going on in OTEC. And the reason is the facilities for OTEC, the circumstances where OTEC could be successful are in developing countries. It depends on the heat differential between the surface temperature and deep water temperature. And you only find that outside Cayman, uh, some in Jamaica, Barbados, it's, 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 it's a tropical thing. So the resources aren't developed country resources. So the research hasn't been outstanding on it. But I, uh, I think I hold with Professor Bing and a few of my colleagues in the Caribbean, and I don't know what Jean-Michel Jean will think of this, whether OTEC really is something worth pursuing uh, in the Caribbean. Thanks a lot for that, Dr. Petrotza. We have to start wrapping now, so I want to give Jean-Michel the opportunity to respond to, to that question um, in 45 seconds, and then um, Mark can sort of like round up his thoughts in the final 45 seconds. So Jean-Michel. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, uh, Dr. Trotz, for the question. So I guess a, a, a quick personal anecdote. Utek was something I was actually quite fascinated with um, through my engineering studies and afterward. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. There's tremendous potential and various value streams you can derive from Utek. Um, but you've, you've put the pin in one of the major challenges, which is the um, lack of research to leverage it in, in our part of the world, as well as um, I guess the pilots to build up and essentially scale this up to, um, you know, some of the what what has what OTEC has been envisioned to be or what it can be. Um, and I would not be <laughs> one to argue with Dr. Binger, but I'd say from my perspective, it's just a resource matter. Um, and it would be nice if, you know, I've spoken to um, professionals being able to distill and guide the development of projects. But I take it one level down. If we can do more research in the region, I would love that as well. But that has also been constrained, I think, by resources and the ability to perform it. Not by our minds, not by our people, but just I, I think it's a resource matter primarily. Um, so so yeah, I see potential. It's just, it's still a challenge. Mark? I mean, I think this is a, you know, these are very deep discussions about, you know, the future of, of, of humanity, to be honest, and, and how we approach solving and tackling some of these large issues that don't just affect, you know, the Caribbean, but affect all, all regions and all peoples. And there's billions of people that that this affects. And so I do think we need new models and new, new modalities of approaching these challenges because, um, you know, I, I just, again, this whole concept of 1.5 degrees, I mean, that is, is so ridiculous. And I know we need to hang our hat on something, but we're so far past that. Uh, and so my, my point is, is like, how, how do we empower with limited resources, the region, the Caribbean region, to come up with these new models and working with the great profession, you know, the great people in the world who have a lot of this knowledge as well, to use it as a proving ground because this is not the end of this discussion. In fact, this is probably the beginning of a much broader discussion over the next centuries, to be honest. So, um, you know, I, I'm I'm up for the challenge to help, and and I'm sure there's lots of great minds there as well. And and I know that Wesley your, yourself are devoting a lot of time and um, really appreciate this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Rabin, Jean-Michel Paul, Dr. Ulrich Trotz. Um, fantastic discussion. I know we could have gone on for the rest of the day, but I think um, that we've hit some of the fundamental points behind this. And the journalists in the audience, I think that there are stories to be exploited when it comes to this. Um, the, the, the ocean tech question and so on. The, what's the price tag on some of these things? Uh, where, is it, where are the resources going to come from? Who is going to foot the bill? All of these things are, are questions that we would need to address as we go along. But we have to make way now for the, for the young people um, among us. And um, Simone Ganpat is going to be hosting this. Um, let me just remove the various spotlights here. Um, uh, Isabella, can you do that for me? Just remove the, the spotlights on, the, on the, the, the speakers that we have so far. They've been removed, Wesley. I've removed them. OK, OK, great. Just not great. Yeah, and so I just want to um, hand over to um, to Simone now, and just I, I'm gonna put I'm gonna make a plug um, 
even before she begins um, to say that, um, that when young people talk about the future and issues such as the climate crisis, they need sometimes to remember that there are people like me and Steve and, and um, Dr. Trotz who will be there uh, for at least some time again in the future. So, um, Simone, over to you. Thank you, Wesley, and good day to everyone. Um, thank you for having this panel of young people um, here to discuss the future of young people in climate change in the face of climate change. Um, and as we know, as the spotlight increases on climate justice and action on climate change, young people are being put on the podium in, in a really, really big way. And we in the Caribbean, we have a different reality to, to other places around the world. And, and so it's, it's really important that we hear from the youth from the young people who are experiencing, you know, the all the transitions and the realities that come with climate change and what it is, and um, it's really important that we that we give young people, including myself, I'm young, just putting that out there, um, the platform to speak about it. So thank you very much to the Media Institute of the Caribbean and Open Society Foundations for given us this platform facilitating this discussion. So I want to um, introduce our panelists for today. And I'm really, really excited because this is a fully young people panel, but also a full panel of women. And that's, that's very important because as we know, or if we didn't know, as we have learned over the, the past um, three days, young people and, and women are uh, of the most vulnerable people to the effects of climate change. So I'm really, really happy and excited to start this, this discussion. So I want to introduce our panelists. We have Janelle Tomlinson, who is a PhD candidate and also uh, she likes to call herself a scholar activist. Um, her work is based on community-based adaptation to climate change. And she's also the founder of two climate change organizations uh, in Jamaica, um, Young People for Action on Climate Change in Jamaica and Girls Care JA. And um, so we are very excited to have you here, Janelle. Uh, we also have Diona Nero, who is the National Coordinator for CYEN in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And Diona is by rights, very involved in, um, in climate change negotiations. She's been a part of CYN for over four years now. So we hope to have a very good discussion on CYN. A lot of us know um, CYN. So we are hoping that we can get into um, their role as a, as a organization in the face of climate change. And we also have Dominique Norales, who is from Belize. And she is uh, currently an undergraduate student pursuing sociology, but Dominique is um, quite an accomplished young person. Um, it started, I think, just from reading her biography, started very young in all of the environmental actions. So um, she's a founding member of a number of boards um, in Belize, as well as the member of a lot of um, organizations in Belize. So I'm very happy to be moderating discussion, very happy and very honored to have a panel full of women and young people at it. So I will invite um, Janelle to start with your opening statement and then followed by Diona and then Dominique. Thank you, Simone. And thank you as well to Diona and to Dominique um, for you know agreeing to be a part of this panel. They're both young women who I know and I'm happy to be sharing this uh, platform with them this morning. So um, just to give a little background as to who I am and my work within them. And I am, as Simone would have mentioned, um, at the intersection of academia and activism within the climate space. So submitting my PhD dissertation, which looks at community-based adaptation in 
in particular, how rural agricultural organizations have been navigating these changes, as well as looking at just overall readiness for adaptation and what that should and could look like taking a bottom up approach to, I guess, development. And in addition to that, as mentioned earlier, I am also engaged with um, YPAC, which is Young People for Action and Climate Change Jamaica, as well as Girls Care, which is a little bit more focused on engaging women or young women across the Caribbean in climate change related work. Um, outside of these two groups, I also serve as the Caribbean advisor for the Next Gen Climate Board, which is a entity from the Global Green Grants Fund that seeks to provide support um, through small grants to grassroots based um, projects on the ground that are youth led. And I also currently serve as the um, sustainability lead for Jamaican women in coffee. So um, all these groups, all these efforts, again, are um, centered on climate change, climate change related issues, looking at awareness, empowerment, engagement. Again, this issue of justice and ensuring that individuals who are already vulnerable, individuals who are already, you know, Janelle, I'm not sure if you're breaking um, up on my end, or I think we got you back. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what's happening with the connectivity, right? And I would say uh, my personal goal within the climate justice context is um, just to make sure that those individuals, who, as I mentioned before, are already disadvantaged, already at risk, do not get left out and you know have individuals making decisions on their behalf without their input. So for me, it's being able to engage them and make sure that the solutions that are developed are by them and for them, where they have a space to share what their past experiences have been, their current experiences, how they have been able to navigate, you know, ongoing changes and ensure that whatever is developed is, you know, suited to their context. Um, Mark in the in the panel before spoke about this one size fits all approach that often accompanies adaptation. For me, I want to make sure that the one size fits all, you know, broad brush approach is not the, 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 the methods that we utilize when we look at these rural communities, when we look at indigenous groups. And so for me, it's empowerment and engagement, but also beyond that and making sure that local voices do in fact get to influence adaptation efforts. So I will pause there and hand back over to Simone um, for our next panelist. Thank you very much, Janelle. Okay, over to you, Diona. Good day, everyone. I'm Diona. I'm from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, in a nutshell, I refer to myself as a youth activist. I'm the current national coordinator of the Caribbean Youth Environment and Network. So that's CYN. So we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the quality of life of Caribbean youth by facilitating their personal development and promoting their full involvement in all matters pertaining to the environment and sustainable development. What the organization promotes is education and training, Caribbean integration and community empowerment as tools to develop the ethnic amongst the young people of the Caribbean and also the conservation and protection of the natural resources. So our central objectives are, uh, as the network is to train and develop youths. Uh, to realize their potential for the future as leaders in the Caribbean while instilling them with the respect of nature and cultural practices and developing their skills for the environmental and resourceful management. So as it pertains to climate justice and climate change on a whole, what um, my aspirations are, are to, apart from providing concrete and realistic steps to combat climate change and a structured framework to hold those accountable for over 80% of the global emissions, which affects the lives and livelihoods of us, you say the small development island states. And I'll pass it to Dominique now. Yeah, thank you very much um, for having this event. I have to first I have a little guide here to, to make sure that I say everything I want to say. 
So first, I have to thank the <laughs> Media Institute of the Caribbean and partner, um, the Open Society Foundation for hosting this event. I think often what is missing from these super, supranatural and intergovernmental conversations, um, and if they do represent these things, they are a bit underrepresented. I think we don't hear the stories of the people who are actually uh, experiencing climate injustice. So trainings of this nature takes us a step closer to telling more sovereign stories, telling more honest stories, and telling more human stories. Um, so my name is Dominique Norales, and I hear from the beautiful Latin American and Caribbean nation of Belize. Though by talking of university, I am joining you this morning from Barbados. Um, I'm currently, um, I've been in this space since 2016 formally, with grassroots organizations back home, but formally joined the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, CYN, in 2018. My entry point into this space um, was quite a personal one, which is why I often make introduction very personal, because the personal is political. And um, there is nowhere where politics is more at play than in the space of climate justice that we are trying to spread as a philosophy and, of course, nurture to have everyone use it as a premise. I am a young person who sits at very many intersections. Um, I happen to be Black, I happen to be female, I happen to be Indigenous as well. And these are all ascriptions that don't really land you in a position of privilege historically. Uh, and so I think those are very important starting points. I grew up on the coast in a port city, Belize city. And port cities are very familiar to us as Caribbean people because they act as the nucleus of sociopolitical and economic development for our nations historically and in contemporary times. Um, and of course, there's a, there's a beautiful livelihood that comes with coming from these places, but it's also marked by, by poverty and the ills that come with poverty. Um, and so until recently, my community um, was caught up with urban sprawling and somewhat and was and is defined by land and bridges. So land and bridges are a very Creole term. It's a phrase uh, which is a play on London Bridge, but these bridges are uh, made of wooden pallets that really network through mangrove forests. And so these are the spaces that I would have grown up in. And I've never had to rush to go to the zoo as a child. In fact, I remember my first visit to the zoo being very underwhelming because I would have been able to see different species of snakes and bird migrations and six and eight foot crocodiles well before age 10. Um, and I think as a child, I didn't understand the dangers of that space because to me it was fun, right? I got to see these cool animals. Um, but as you grow older and you become, you recognize the dangers of these spaces, um, you begin to ask yourself, why would your family put you in a situation that is this precarious, right? But the answer is, is quite simple. You could not get land unless you took it, right? And so squatting became um, a, a, a very, prominent and familiar feature of my entire community. In fact, my community is a is an area that was built because of squatting on Crown land. And of course, we were able to get the official papers later on by, by, by talking of um, longevity of living in that space. Um, because people could not access land, the land services because of corruption, because of lack of capacity, because you had to go all the way to Belmopan, which is in the interior of Belize to get access to lands. And it really moved slower than flowing molasses to get to these spaces, right? As development occurred, and I think, and streets were pushed through by force, only predicated, I think, by the amount of voters available in these spaces, um, the hurricane and rainy seasons turned these streets into small rivers. Houses flooded, rooftops were missing, and we, of course, got visits from our wild friends that would have come down in floodwaters. So I can go really on and on and discuss this sociopolitical intermingling of climate justice and resilience, but also of politics and poverty. But it was really the genesis of my own work with policy, um, be it with the CDB, Youth Policy and Operational Strategy, or Belize's National Youth Policy. It is a dialogue that I hope we can give justice to in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but of course, it is my privilege to join these two, these three young women on this panel, and I hope that we can um, really have a dynamic discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. And I, I expect that we will have a very engaging and dynamic discussion. 
And just remember, we are in a room full of journalists uh, who are eager and awaiting information and stories. So um, let's get right at it. So when we, um, when we think about young people, especially in the, the era of um, information and sensation, sensationalism, it's very easy for us to look um, at the world and from, from a I'm by myself perspective. And often we see, um, when we think about young people in, in terms of um, climate justice, uh, we see strikes, you know, that's, that's sometimes that's the first thing that people see, activism and strikes and, you know, these sorts of things. And actually, interestingly, I read an article uh, just yesterday speaking about the uh, launch of a new climate justice alliance in the Caribbean. But what um, stood out to me was that the photo that the, um, the article used, it was of uh, somebody who is probably not, does not exist in the Caribbean, you know, probably somewhere in Europe, um, pulling up a climate change sign. You know, so it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to look at it from our perspective, from the inside looking out, but something that I think that we don't speak about enough um, especially for young people living in this age is the realities from a Caribbean perspective. So I'm hoping that we could touch a little bit about that. What does climate justice look from, look like in the Caribbean? And if you can also touch on where the, where the young people currently lie in this decision-making process. Um, Janelle, I would love if we could start with you. Right, thanks for that, Simone. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because I do know that there was a study that was actually recently done looking at climate justice in the Caribbean and, you know, um, there was just some of the ongoing efforts, initiatives. And from my understanding and what I, um, I think came, maybe also some of the initial findings of that is that climate justice is an emerging, um, what would I say, movement in the Caribbean. So it's not something that is as well established maybe as in other regions, because I think just even the issue of climate change is even just now becoming very popular among youth and you know adaptation and climate efforts. I think what has been the focus um, where youth are concerned has been you know, the idea of environmental conservation. So we're looking at um, coastal cleanups and all these efforts. So those have been the kind of activities that have led in the past and maybe more so the recent past. And I think now we're now recognizing that climate change is increasingly becoming you know, the hot topic, the challenge that we have to contend with. I you know we think about it, we often talk about youth being the future but Dominic and Diona know that it's not the future, it's a no thing. It's how do we create opportunities now so that the future doesn't pose you know, these challenges that we can't um, seek to address. And so I think with that in mind, we recognize now that climate justice, environmental justice has become something at the forefront of many of these groups. A lot of them have now you know, been transitioning their efforts to looking at how they can foster awareness raising campaigns, how they can create opportunities for young people to share, you know, the experiences that they've had for um, rural communities, indigenous communities to share the changes that they have been seeing because individuals on the front lines, these individuals who rely so heavily on the environment, fisher folk, farmers, individuals in communities that are heavily, you know, dependent on agriculture, they're the ones who see the changes first. And so to be able to exactly understand what is happening where climate change is concerned, they are the ones who have to relay their stories. They are the ones who can tell us how different you know, their realities and contexts are. And so I think that where youth are positioned in that space, where we are now is that yes, we are the ones kind of helping to, what I say, raise awareness on that. But I do think we have a greater role to play where climate justice is concerned because I think for a lot of governments, for a lot of spaces, it has been engagement. And while we are seeing increasing engagement, I don't think it can stop at engagement. It has to be something more um, beyond that. So what do these engagements seek to foster? Are we utilizing the youth voice as we look forward for, towards policies, towards plans, towards programs? Are there inputs being used to, um, how would I say, to, to influence how we design activities? And so I think that while engagement is important, it needs to move beyond that. And 
ensure that you know the experiences the opinions that are being shared are helping to you know shape whatever policies are being developed whatever plans are being put forward and also you know just ensure that it doesn't stay as a report that is written up at the end and placed somewhere and then nothing um happens beyond that so i think those are just my initial thoughts on youth engagement um currently within crime and justice um i don't know if i should hand over to one of the ladies or you will do that but i'll just pass for now Thank you very much for that, that contribution. Uh, Dominique, can you uh, give us your perspectives on that? Of course, I think, like Janelle mentioned, this idea of climate justice is an emerging feature in the activism space. I think even CYN, and not I think I know, because I just just at a retreat last week, um, our programming is really moving toward climate justice as well. So even from the, the Caribbean youth environment space, network space, Climate justice is a is a thing that we're just not articulating in our space. We might have been doing it in little ways here or there, but we're articulating it as a actual direction for ourselves. Um, and when I think about young people in a space in Belize, it's I think uh, taking care of the environment is part and parcel of who we are. I remember coming to Barbados and and hearing that people. And I don't know if anyone else. I, I apologize if I offend anyone. But hearing that people eat parrot fish was like, oh my gosh, like you're eating parrot fish. That's so crazy to me because we have been taught to not eat parrot fish because it, it helps the coral reef and we do all of that. Um, and so people have really been informally been a part of the, the climate awareness space. Um, young people have been organizing. I know the, the Global Environmental, Global Environment um, Facility Small Grants Program has made a young person a part of their highest decision-making body as well, which I used to serve as um, just before I left for university. And so I think young people are in this space, but I think it requires a bit more um, formalization. And that in and of itself, just coming from a youth development perspective um, is a challenge. Keeping a youth group together is a challenge. If you don't have money to fund it, if you, and, and taking, a, taking care of, everybody's basic needs because it is often the communities that are poorest that need the most awareness and activism to tie together their experience with what policy is saying. And so a lot of my work and a lot of the training that I do and any interaction that I have, I try to have everyday people understand there are people who are making policy decisions about you and you need to understand what those policy policies are saying. Um, to then make sure that they're, they're in your best interest and not only in your best interest, but in the best interest of your community. Thank you, Dominique. I, I, think, I think that's a excellent, um, those are excellent points. Uh, Diona, can we hear from you? Uh, yes, just to piggyback off of what uh, Dominique mentioned, there's a lot of barriers that youth are experiencing, especially in St. Vincent, where the youths, they're not engaged enough. And what they're saying is that, yes, we want to be involved, but how can we get involved? And when we're involved, how are we gonna stay involved? Because, because due to technology, youths, their attention span, it's getting lower. And if we have a conference and posters don't want to be interactive, how are we gonna get them interactive? And as it pertains to climate justice, youths, they don't want to hear anything about as it pertains to justice, they want to be more in the social world. And especially if they don't know exactly what is affecting them, they, don't, they won't care what's going on. And how do we get them to be more passionate about what's going on around them? And I am from a farming community, so that really stemmed my basis to be a part of this uh, organization and where we can just spread the awareness and just get more involved. But youths, we now have to build off of what the framework is and just have a more well understanding of what we are approaching. Thank you, Tiona. So these are all excellent points. Um, engagement is a is a real, real thing that, that is now emerging, as Janelle said. Um, but formalization of youth, youth engagement and, and young people who are, who are interested and saying that we want a change. It, it, it really needs to happen. Um, 
Dominique, it was very interesting to me in your opening statement where you gave a bit of perspective about your community and um, the, squatting, the squatting community, but also the socio-political, um, geographical factors that, that surround this community that you live in, um, in Belize. So I want uh, to talk a bit about these, and this is kind of piggybacking off of, of what we just spoke about, but these barriers to integrating youth, because you, the young people are at, at their core, this is probably biased, but very innovative. I think, um, especially seeing as that we are the people seeing it happen. We are the people who, who when people before us have gone, we are the people who have to deal with it. And we are the people who will have to make the decision at some point. And it's, it's very important that we are part of that discussion now, because uh, as Janelle said, we are, we are experiencing it. I think everyone said that we are, we are the ones who are at the forefront. So um, Dominique, if you could start by talking a bit about the, the barriers, especially um, in the context of, of Belize and your hometown in particular, the barriers to integrating young people into this emerging climate justice sphere. Well, the, the barriers really, thank you for the question, Simone. The barriers are really, you can kind of apply a broad brushes to why young people don't as much to, in today's world. And I think the, our discussion at our retreat for CYN would have covered this. Um, why are young people not getting involved in formal institutions and formal organizations? From a Belizean perspective, I can tell you, especially from my community, people are preoccupied with surviving, right? They're preoccupied with making sure that, um, and this is a, this is a quite a morbid um, sort of example, you're preoccupied to making sure that you get home alive in communities where gun violence is, is rapid. So when you're, if, if, if for example, my, my streets are, are flooding for, after two minutes of raining, I am trying to get home without being shot or robbed as opposed to, oh, I'm worrying about why the, the, the drains are flooding. So these are um, some of the things that we kind of have to contend with as young people. Um, when it comes to this organizational structure um, and looking at, and I, I, I'm taking this point from national youth councils and regional youth councils and why they have been struggling, I think it's a part of administrative and technical capacity as well. Some organizations, many organizations, young people, yes, we are expected to volunteer. And I'm a I'm a I'm a avid advocate for people to volunteer and to intern, right? But you also have to make sure that people are um, getting their due, right? So you have to get to these meetings, get to these internships. How am I going to eat in the afternoon? How am I going to pay for the bus? How am I going to do all of this? Um, yes, I do want to get involved, but there are things that I must do to ensure that I could get to the, the venue itself. And uh, we experience this very often with young people coming to clean ups or coming to meetings, as Diona would have mentioned. Um, people won't come unless there's something to go for. And it's not necessarily for the information you're going to get. Some young people are going to get a free meal, and that is just the reality. So when I, when I used to work with the government of Belize as an intern in the Department of Youth Services, and they want to have meetings with young people on the fly, first of all, on the fly. Secondly, they want to have meetings with young people and not have a sort of incentive attached. Um, if even it's just a, a table of food and drinks and refreshments, young people will not come. And so that is one of the, the barriers that I think we face, not only at the climate justice, environmental awareness, um, space and it's not that your people just want handouts want handouts but it's just the reality in which we are living yes and i i actually i've had experience with that you know um with a ngo that i volunteer with and actually um the other day we were given the i was given the opportunity to um head start for a grant that's coming up later on in the year, but this grant is about uh, environmental conservation. And this was, we had, we were able to have a one-on-one -on -one with the with the grantee. And, you know, they told us, it was 15 people from across the Caribbean. And they told us, 
you know, this is a, it, it was a fundraising and grant writing workshop. And they said, we don't get enough engagement from the Caribbean. We don't get enough, um, we don't get enough applicants from the Caribbean. So we want to give you guys this free course um, so that you can apply for our grants coming up. And the course was great, but when it came down to the end of it and we were speaking about budgets and so on, they said, well, we will pay you if you need to consult anybody, but we're not going to pay you for your work. And that was, I mean, that was a really big issue. And then we, some of us came to realize, well, this is kind of the case with a lot of grants, not all, but a lot. They, you know, you, you do all this work um, with this amount of money and you, I mean, you put in the work to write your proposal and all of that, it gets through. And then, you know, you aren't incentivized or, you know, not even a stipend or something like that. So it's, it's really, um, it's, a, it's a reality that, that we have to think about, especially when we, we start um, engaging with these people. Uh, for me, it was uh, good to be able to be in that discussion with those people so we could have told them, well, this is not, this is not, um, you know, Europe or America where, jobs are easy to come by or easier than here you know we're not just um doing this for fun this is also for our livelihood and our survival and it was you know I think we need more of that um Diona can you offer your perspective on this on these barriers uh one example I could definitely give is the barrier of age and experience I could give an example where I would have attended a workshop and persons were given feedback and it was to put forward for a project. So we were given examples of what the theme could be. So there was never a follow-up in terms of what would have um, proceeded after the workshop. A few months after, I'm at home, I'm hearing the announcement of the project. So I'm like, why I didn't have any uh, update about the project. And it, it was put forward that our theme was chosen that CYM would have, would have given. And there was no initial follow-up. So when someone, when we propose that we're youth and we're given our inputs, opposed to someone who has like 25 years experience, they will go with that person instead of the youth's perspective. So that's one barrier that we have been experiencing here in St. Vincent. Thank you. It's very, I'm seeing some comments. Um, let me just take this time. I don't think I said it before. Some comments from the audience, but feel free to raise your hands. We want this to be a discussion. Uh, so raise your hands. And if we have the time to take some questions, we can take them. Um, Janelle, how, how, how has your experience, uh, how, 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 how has that made you understand, you know, the barriers that we face, especially um, in the context of Young People for Action on Climate Change, as well as a PhD candidate um, going out there and, you know, talking to people who are actually at the, at the forefront. What are the barriers that, that you have experienced? Well, thanks, Simone. And I think I echo the sentiments that would have been expressed by Dominic and Diona because this issue of incentivized participation is very important. Where there are no incentives, you know, persons start to lose interest because at the end of the day, it's almost like a what's in it for me kind of thing. And again, you can understand persons are concerned about as in the Caribbean, we see our bread and butter. What's going to happen tomorrow? How am I going to survive next week? Climate change is a technical thing for experts and, you know, people at university to think about who am I as a small man? You deal with that. I have to think about my family. Um, and even for some young persons as well, they tell you that, you know, I'm concerned about helping my parents in a, on a farm or, you know, trying to make sure that there are sufficient resources in the house. So you're telling me that I need to think about these things, you know, that's for you te technical experts to think about. And as um, Dominic rightly said, if there are no direct benefits or tangible benefits, then persons lose interest. Um, Diona also said it, this issue of ageism. And I think as well, persons automatically equate knowledge or experience with age. Not saying that, you know, these individuals should not be given, you know, their fair share, or, or, as they say, give to Caesar, what is Caesar's. Yes, you've been in the space for a while. And yes, you understand. 
But I do think that persons who have been, you know, engaging in a space, engaging particular individuals, you know, trying to understand their perspectives should also be given some amount of recognition for what they have found, for the experiences they have, and also for, you know, persons who are also would have been um, affected by these things for some time. And so in addition to the issue of, um, ageism and again, incentivized participation. I also think that for the young people who are in fact, um, you know, ready and gearing, when they recognize that oftentimes, again, their efforts almost fall on deaf ears, it can be disheartening as well. Because when you think of CYE, and as Diona would have said, they would have sat down and brainstormed and thought about, you know, this theme and to recognize the theme was selected without even recognizing them, then it can be disheartening. And we have seen it here in the Jamaican space as well. I have a colleague who she engages in all these different things. She's a part of all these entities. And to recognize that at the end of it, um, your it's almost as if your opinions will fall on their fears or if somebody who is more recognized or somebody who is considered you know to be more um, established in the space takes your idea and pitches it it's almost as if it's the most amazing thing ever so again it's almost as if being a young person comes with all these disadvantages and comes with the idea that you know what maybe if i propose my idea and have someone else pitch it it might move forward so for me ageism the idea of seeing young persons as you know inexperienced and not being experts and again having the funds and resources to be able to incentivize individuals are just some of the obstacles that we have to you know contend with when we think about justice climate justice and how we continue to engage um persons thank you janelle um so we spoke about uh these barriers and i, I want to make uh, a very, I want to repeat a very important point that all of uh, our panelists touched on. There's a very fine line between survival and wanting to, the, the need to do more. There's, there's a survival, there's a line between um, volunteerism and working for livelihood, you know? And, and for you, it's, I mean, it's, it's evident. Um, that there is some type of disconnect. Um, there's a lot of climate change related anxiety uh, with, with people of all ages, but um, we see it, you know, we hear about it. People, young people, you know, I was telling somebody just the other day, a lot of people, I actually spoke about this um, last week when we were speaking about the intergenerational impacts. There's a lot of people who, don't want to have children, you know, um, because of climate change. You know, their their climate change anxiety is is a really real thing, and it's a it's a barrier to young people to want to get into this space. It it, it might just also be a, a um a boosting factor, you know. Let me let me do something about it. But not everybody is like that, you know. Um, and we spoke about the barriers, but all of you are very crucial parts of organizations and movements in your own ways, in your own countries. And you all are living examples that young people are very innovative and young people can be heard and will do what they must to be heard and to be integrated. So I just want to um, move the discussion uh, to talk a bit about the innovative um, initiatives and, and things that you all have each been a part of or um, had spearheaded in your own ways so that we can um, start to think about or get the audience to think about the ways in which young people have already um, done something different and, and start, are starting to set an example for, for the change that needs to happen. Uh, Diona, would you mind starting off this um, discussion? No problem. So one uh, initiative we would have um, started about two or three years ago is that we had a, lim a limited amount of members, so we wanted to have an increase. So we had a membership drive within the capital uh, city, Kingston. 
So we were just educating persons about CYN and as it pertains to climate change and other information. So I guess it was a half day for schools. So they, they had an influx of um, students coming about. So we were asking them, uh, do you know what is climate change? So a lot of them look very puzzled towards the world. Do we, we ask, do you know what is resilience? No one knew what resilience was. So we realized that climate change wasn't being educated in the secondary and primary schools. So what we went about doing is creating clubhouses within the schools. So we would do monthly visits to the school as it pertains to the clubs and we would educate them on relevant information as it um, pertains to the environment and the climate justice and climate change. And also other initiatives we would have um, taken on is feeding the homeless and just educating them, beach, our normal beach cleanup and also having community visits and also collaborating with other institutions such as the Savings to Conservation Fund, the police, youth clubs, so we could educate all youths as it pertains to the environment and climate change. Thank you, Dominique. Yes, and I, I want to make several quick points here. Um, first, I think when we started, Simone, you mentioned that maybe you may be biased in saying that young people are innovators. That is not biased, that is fact. Um, many, many of the people who have led our nations and are leading our nations now and even leading our homes have started it from a very, very, very young age, um, late teens, early 20s. And so young people have the capacity to really impact the, the world um, as they are existing in it now, but also in the future. Uh, Wesley would have mentioned something in the chat as well about um, the generations not wanting to, to step out the way. I believe in intergenerational collaboration. Um, I think what, I just think there needs to be more respect um, for young people. I just don't want, us, don't want people to see us as, oh, these are overly energetic young people that just want to protest and picket and do all of these very um, quote unquote violent things. What we do need to do is to, and that is not to disrespect protesters. I am, uh, I am, I am done for the protest. But we also need to understand that young people like Janelle are scholar activists, they are researchers, and like yourself, they are researchers, they are doing a lot of work in academic and political space as policy workers as well. So we need to recognize young people for the work we're doing. It's about, it's about respect. Um, and then just finally on the point of, of justice, and I think it's, it's I wanted to, to end the last discussion that we would have had. Um, this idea of justice is not how it's, it goes beyond equity, it goes beyond equality. It's about um, this marriage of opportunity and, and of technical skill and capacity, right? Because some spaces offer young people opportunity, but young people have no capacity to, to make good use of it. How can you give me something that I don't know how to use? And in other spaces, give you all this technical capacity and you're overwhelmed and, oh, my training, 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 and then you have nowhere to use it. Just this is about tying those two things together, making sure there is opportunity and there is technical skill to use that opportunity. And so that's where I want to end with that climate justice um, conversation there. Thanks very much. I think um, I think capacity building is, is extremely important and it's something that we it's something that we tend to um, bypass, you know. They're like young people, young people, young people, and then realize, okay, well. Are we giving the young people the tools? Okay, you want the platform, take the platform. But are we giving you the tools? Are we giving you the incentives? Are we, are we, are we offering collaboration? And you're very correct. Collaboration is very important. And um, just in that same program that I was talking about earlier, one of the moderators said, collaboration, not competition. It's not a competition. Um, yes, we as young people are of the most um, vulnerable, but it, it, that even probably strengthens the, the need for collaboration, to understand each other's contribution, understand each other's weaknesses and each other's strengths. Um, we have just a little bit of time left. Janelle, I'll let you uh, have your contribution and then we can close off. Um, uh, thanks, Simone. So I think um, whenever we think about environmental justice, climate justice, there are always these three C's that I think are critical. So it's communication, collaboration, and cohesion. 
And, you know, Dominic said it just now, the importance of intersectional, you know, kind of engagements. And I think it's critical because we can't erase, you know, the, the, the knowledge that is held by all of those who were before us, because of course, what they have to share is important, but so is the knowledge of the youth and these emerging, or, or we call ourselves call it activists, academics in this space. It's almost the same way when we think about development. Is it top down, is it bottom up? No, I think it can be, you know, um, a convergence of both. So it's not a matter of one or the other. So it's not dichotomy, but diversity. And it's something that we actually spoke about yesterday in um, a conversation that we were having with some of the young women. And so when I think about just some of the initiatives that we've had, um, recently CUIEN would have partnered um, on work with climate change and health. And we tried to put together a paper that explored, you know, just some of these topics that were not necessarily as um, out there in the public space. So we did collaborate um, on some research papers that would have, again, had youth involvement and kind of creating that space for youth to not only build their capacities, but to showcase some of the ongoing work. Um, outside of the work of CYA and just talking about the other entities I'm involved in, um, through one of our groups, Girls Care, we have a mentorship program going on now for young women in the Caribbean. And that is um, an important space because I think that we created that because we recognize that, you know, for having youth or young women in this space to be able to, you know, find that place where they can say, okay, I'm invested, I'm interested in environmental justice, but I don't necessarily understand how movement building works, how grant writing works. So we've created this space to be able to provide that support for them. And I think it has been going well, it's our second cohort. And so we have, you know, been trying to create that space. And I do know as well that um, CYN has these more collaborative spaces where it's not just a, a, a chapter in Barbados or a chapter in Belize or a chapter in Jamaica, but spaces where all the different chapters can collaborate, again, pushing that um, idea of collaboration. And so when we think about um, justice, it's also about ensuring that we're not necessarily duplicating efforts. It's seeing that what is happening in these different spaces, how all of us can utilize the resources we have, the energy we have, the innovative skill sets that we have to push this agenda. As it was said before, it's not a competition, it's about collaboration. And so for me, it is creating that space for Caribbean youth to be able to work together. And I'm going to put this plug at this point, YPAC is launching the Caribbean Youth Climate Coalition that we're hoping to create a space again for all these entities to be able to work together. And of course it's funded by OSF. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that as we move forward. But again, it's just promoting work that is already being done and making sure that everybody can you know, contribute to the ongoing work. So thanks Simone and thanks ladies. Thank you, Janelle. Uh, yeah, I, I really look forward to that um, that new initiative. I, I see that Open Society Foundation is funding um, a lot of these initiatives, and, and, and I think that it, it, it really is important to, to get the youth involved, young people involved. And as you said, integration is a very important part. I am in Trinidad and Tobago. I have my own experiences, I have my own perspectives, um, and all of you are from different countries and the local context is sometimes very different from the, it, it is at, it, at its core, it's different from the regional context. Um, and there, there needs to be some emphasis on integration. Um, we don't have much more time, uh, Dr. Trotz's hand is up, so I'll let him um, just give his contribution and hopefully then we can wrap up. Dr. Trotz. Thanks, there's so much I would love to say. Congrats to the three panelists uh, and to the moderator. Excellent session. Uh, Dominique, I would hazard a guess that you're Garifuna. <laughs> I'm in I Belize. Am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, look, what I like, it's obvious that uh, you all know exactly what role you should be playing in this transition uh, as we move forward. All of our countries are talking about green growth, et cetera. You know about the role that you're capable of playing and that you should play. My question is, uh, how do you make sure 
that you insinuate youth interests into what is going on in the region at the decision-making level to make sure that those interests are not ignored and more than that, that you play a vital role in implementation. Do you have, I, it's obvious you know that you have to work together, et cetera, but you need to move it to a different level where you are in the face of our decision makers. And when they make decisions, they cannot ignore youth interests or youths as partners in rolling out a regional program. Janelle, would you like to respond to that? Um, so thank you for sharing that question, Doc. Um, so I, I think one of the things that has been happening in the Jamaican space is that increasingly there are youth or what I say, no, representatives that are being invited to I wouldn't even say the decision-making tables, but tables that are um, spaces for dialogue and discussion. Um, so I think there has been increased um, engagement of youth in some of these spaces as to how we are trying to hold governments accountable, you know, trying to make sure that we move just beyond um, creating synergies or working together. Um, what we have been doing or through some of the spaces is calling them out when they go against what they say that they would do. So for example, we would have had our elections last December and some of the things that they put forward in some of the manifestos, they are pretty much um, going against a lot of these now. And so what I think a lot of the youth groups have been doing, they have been utilizing social media as a space for, um, I guess, raising awareness and bringing attention to some of these um, challenges or disturbances. So for example, we see persons going in and wanting to build in areas that are supposed to be um, protected or areas that are supposed to have mangrove forests. And so I think what we have been trying to do is to make sure that we hold them accountable and utilize these spaces for just pinpointing where we're seeing the challenges and making sure that they recognize that we are aware that they're breaching um, these, uh, what would I say, these commitments that they have made. So I think that's what we have been doing, but of course there is room for improvements and making sure that we create also other avenues for holding them accountable and um, creating opportunities for transparency. Can I be so presumptuous as to suggest to you that you consider something like uh, first starting with a Caribbean Regional Assembly on Youth for Climate Change, uh, which of course, hmm. they, I always uh, come back to make, there will be great partners in giving great visibility to that, where you come out with a statement about issues that impact youth and that you need to, to uh, address. Uh, and also promoting the youth issue uh, to be on the agenda, of our heads of government. And using that as a basis for an even wider coalition to a Commonwealth Youth Assembly and Climate Change, which I suggest that because when you look at the Commonwealth, we have everybody at the table. The developed countries, we have the big coal burners like India and South Africa. We have the large OPEC like Nigeria. Uh, we have Trinidad here, pa uh, part of OPEC. We have most of us, the small island developing states. We have most of the LDCs. So it's all shades of opinion uh, across the, uh, the, the, the climate change spectrum. So moving to that, it's unfortunate that we are so late in the year because that would have been a very good vehicle to carry a statement to the Commonwealth heads of government meeting later this year. But start to think about, you know, uh, politicizing in a way, uh, the whole effort to, to make sure that you are in the face of our decision makers, not only that, but also in the general public in the Caribbean. Thank you so much, Dr. Trump. And I, I see that the three, the four of you have the energy and the initiative to pull something like that off. <laughs> <laughs> we will um, we will hear about the four of us very soon it seems <laughs> um thank you dr Schutz. i i think you just cemented the 
the point that collaboration is key. I think that advice was very well received from all of us and I hope from the audience. Um, this is exactly what we're talking about, uh, intergenerational collaboration. Um, and like, I think, I think it was Dominique that said it, the political is personal, the personal is political. So I want to um, end with this. I, I think we had, we, we had a lot to still discuss, but I think we got through quite a lot. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the Media Institute of the Caribbean and Open Society Foundations for facilitating this platform where uh, us young people uh, can, can discuss these, these realities that we face very candidly. And um, thanks to the audience as well. Here, and I'll hand it back to you. Um, thank you, Simone. And, and thank you to our panelists and Dr. Trotz for making that statement. I realize that Dr. Trotz has a strategy, you know? He plants the little seeds and see who's going to hold on to the tree to grow with it. So Dr. Trotz, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you, you know, your passion, it, it amazes me quite honestly, because I know you've devoted your life to this area of work and, and you're still there um, for people like us who are starting and continuing. So thank you for that. Um, let me just say that, you know, Media Institute of the Caribbean would be very willing and to, to lend any support if you all were to look at that kind of a regional platform and developing it. One thing we know we have is we have some event logistics experience and, uh, and it's something that we can do. And Wesley and I would tell you, MIC came about over coffee. It was really just us having coffee in the Hyatt. And um, if you stick with it, you know, you could keep growing it. I also want to use the opportunity to let the journalists know that I think from all of the, the story perspectives and story angles and ideas we've heard over these four sessions, tapping into the youth organizations um, for coming up with story ideas and working with them on the story ideas is also another approach. And um, I felt that we were ending on the right note with having this youth panel, because you realize that um, this is something that they are, they are living 24 seven and it's their passion and they know a lot more than I think many of us do and, and understand what's happening in the community more than, than many of us do. So I'm encouraging you to also look at that and tap into that because I think we need to help give them that voice because they are the ones who will create the change and they are the ones inheriting tomorrow. I think we owe it to them in many ways. So to all of you, thank you for participating in our webinar series, Climate Justice, Journalistic Perspectives. It was our pleasure to host this and we know this is not going to be the last one, but we want to thank our supporter, Open Society Foundations for seeing the value in doing this. And to all of our speakers and presenters, who we realize have the same passion for this topic. We want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to be with us and to giving us your guidance, insight, and experience to make this first of its kind climate justice journalism platform um, what it turned out to be, which was really excellent. So to you all, I wish you all the very best as you continue to give this area coverage on others. And I want to wish you all um, a very safe rest of year and uh, God's blessings to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>